Good evening, and welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy, and tonight we're in Ottawa for the opening of this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. The Bell Theatre on the campus of Carleton University is completely sold out, a standing-room-only crowd to hear Ronald Wright give the first of five lectures collectively titled A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country, what it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. This year, the Massey lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cutstones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight, from the Bell Theatre at Carleton University in Ottawa, Gauguin's Questions, the first in the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. It really is a, a great honor for me to be giving these lectures and a great pleasure to kick them off here in Ottawa. And on Guy Fawkes Night, I don't know how many people here <laughs> know that it's Guy Fawkes Night, but by a strange coincidence, it is the 399th anniversary to the day of the gunpowder treason plot against the Westminster Parliament, not the one over there, which actually I think, I mean, we used to, in England, learn this little rhyme, remember, remember, the 5th of November gunpowder treason plot. And I think it really is worth remembering now because it tells us that the war on terror and the various manipulations of that have been with us for a very long time. So the first hour, the first of the Massey lectures, Gauguin's questions. The French painter and writer Paul Gauguin, by most accounts, mad, bad, and dangerous to know, suffered acutely from cosmological vertigo induced by the work of Darwin and other Victorian scientists. In the 1890s, Gauguin ran away from Paris, from family and a stockbroking career, to paint and to bed native girls in the tropics. Like many a troubled soul, he could not escape so easily from himself, despite great efforts to do so with the help of drink and opium. At the bottom of his disquiet lay a longing to find what he called the savage, primordial man and woman, humanity in the raw, the elusive essence of our kind. This quest eventually drew him to Tahiti and other South Sea Islands where traces of a pre-contact world, an unfallen world in his eyes, lingered beneath the cross and tricolore. In 1897, after he'd been there quite a long time, a mail steamer docked at Tahiti, bringing terrible news. Gauguin's favorite child, Aline, had died suddenly from pneumonia. After months of illness, poverty, and suicidal despair, the artist managed to harness his grief to produce a vast painting, more a mural in conception than a canvas, in which, like the Victorian age itself, he demanded new answers to the riddle of existence. He wrote the title boldly on the image, three childlike questions, simple yet profound. Where do we come from? What are we? Where? are we going? The work is a sprawling panorama of enigmatic figures amid scenery that might be the groves of heathen Tahiti or an unruly Garden of Eden. 
worshippers or gods, cats, birds, a resting goat, a great idol, and a young human pair who, the artist wrote, dare to consider their destiny. Gauguin's third question, where are we going, is what I want to address in these talks. It may seem unanswerable. Who can foretell the human course through time? But I think we can answer it in broad strokes by answering the other two questions first. If we see clearly what we are and what we've done, we can recognize human behaviors that persist through many times and cultures. And knowing these can tell us what we are likely to do and where we are likely to go from here. Our civilization, which subsumes most of its predecessors, is a great ship steaming at speed into the future. It travels faster, further, and more laden than any before. We may not be able to foresee every reef and hazard, but by reading her compass bearing and headway, by understanding her design, her safety record, and the abilities of her crew, we can, I think, plot a wise course between the narrows and bergs looming ahead. And I believe we must do this without delay, because there are too many shipwrecks behind us. The vessel we are now aboard is not merely the biggest of all time, it's also the only one left. The future of everything we've accomplished since our intelligence evolved will depend on the wisdom of our actions over the next few years. Like all creatures, humans have made their way in the world so far by trial and error. Unlike other creatures, we have a presence so colossal that error is a luxury we can no longer afford. The world has grown too small to forgive us any big mistakes. Despite certain events of the 20th century, most people in the Western cultural tradition still believe in the Victorian ideal of progress, a belief succinctly defined by the historian Sidney Pollard in 1968 as the assumption that a pattern of change exists in the history of mankind, that it consists of irreversible changes in one direction only, and that this direction is towards improvement. Our technological culture measures human progress by technology. The club is better than the fist, the arrow better than the club, the bullet better than the arrow. So we came to this belief for empirical reasons, because it delivered. Pollard notes that the idea of material progress is a very recent one, significant only in the past 300 years or so, coinciding with the rise of science and industry and the corresponding decline of traditional beliefs. We no longer give much thought to moral progress, a prime concern of earlier times, except to assume that it goes hand in hand with the material. Civilized people, we tend to think, not only smell better, but behave better than barbarians or savages. Well, this notion has trouble standing up in the court of history, and I shall return to it in the next lecture when considering what is meant by civilization. Our practical faith in progress has ramified and hardened into an ideology, a secular religion which, like the religions that progress has challenged, is blind to certain flaws in its credentials. Progress, therefore, has become myth in the anthropological sense. And by this, I don't mean a belief that is flimsy or untrue. Successful myths are powerful and often partly true. As I've written elsewhere, myth is an arrangement of the past, whether real or imagined, in patterns that reinforce a culture's deepest values and aspirations. Myths are so fraught with meaning that we live and die by them. They are the maps by which cultures navigate through time. The myth of progress has sometimes served us well, those of us at the best tables anyway, and may continue to do so. 
But I shall argue in these talks that it's also become dangerous. Progress has an internal logic that can lead beyond reason to catastrophe. A seductive trail of successes may end in a trap. Take weapons, for example. Ever since the Chinese invented gunpowder, there has been great progress in the making of bangs, from the firecracker to the cannon, from the petard to the high explosive shell. And just when high explosives were reaching a state of perfection, progress found the infinitely bigger bang within the atom. But when the bang we can make can blow up our world, we've made rather too much progress. Several of the scientists who created the atomic bomb recognized this in the 1940s, telling politicians and others that the new weapons had to be destroyed. Albert Einstein wrote, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and we thus drift toward unparalleled catastrophes. And a few years later, President Kennedy said, if mankind does not put an end to war, war will put an end to mankind. When I was a boy in the 1950s, the shadow of too much progress in weaponry of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and a number of vaporized Pacific islands had already fallen over the world. It has now darkened our lives for about 60 years, and so much has been said on the subject that I needn't add more. My point here is that weapons technology was merely the first area of human progress to reach an impasse by threatening to destroy the planet on which it developed. At the time, this progress trap was seen as an aberration. In all other fields, including those of nuclear power and chemical pesticides, the general faith in progress was largely unshaken. Advertisements of the 1950s showed a smiling Mrs. 1970, who, having bought the right brand of vacuum cleaner, was enjoying the future in advance. Each year's motor car looked different from the previous years, especially if it wasn't. And peasants were freed from vermin with generous dustings of DDT in what became known as the Third World. So in both its capitalist and communist versions, the great promise of modernity was progress without limit and without end. The collapse of the Soviet Union led many to conclude that there was really only one way of progress after all. In 1992, Francis Fukuyama, a former US State Department official, declared that capitalism and democracy were the end of history, not only its destination, but its goal. Doubters pointed out that capitalism and democracy are not necessarily bedfellows, citing Nazi Germany, modern China, and the worldwide archipelago of sweatshop tyrannies. Yet Fukuyama's naive triumphalism strengthened a belief, mainly on the political right, that those who have not chosen the true way forward should be made to do so for their own good, by force if necessary. In this respect, and in the self-interest it obscures, the current ideology of progress resembles the missionary projects of past empires, whether 7th century Islam, 16th century Spain, or 19th century Britain. Since the Cold War ended, we have held the nuclear genie at bay, but haven't begun to stuff it back in its bottle. Yet we're busy unleashing other powerful forces, cybernetics, biotechnology, nanotechnology, that we hope will be good tools, but whose consequences we cannot foresee. The most immediate threat, though, may be nothing more glamorous than our own waste. Like most problems with technology, pollution is a problem of scale. The biosphere might have been able to tolerate our dirty old friends' coal and oil if we'd burned them gradually, but how long can it withstand a blaze of consumption so frenzied that the dark side of this planet glows like a fanned ember in the night of space? Alexander Pope said rather snobbishly that a little learning is a dangerous thing. 
Thomas Huxley later asked, where is the man who has so much as to be out of danger? Technology is addictive. Material progress creates problems that are, or seem to be, soluble only by further progress. Again, the devil here is in the scale. A good bang can be useful, a better bang can end the world. So far, I've spoken of such problems as if they were purely modern, arising from industrial technologies. But while progress strong enough to destroy the world is indeed modern, the devil of scale who transforms benefits into traps has plagued us since the Stone Age. This devil lives within us and gets out whenever we steal the march on nature, tipping the balance between cleverness and recklessness, between need and greed. Paleolithic hunters who learned how to kill two mammoths instead of one had made progress. Those who learned how to kill 200 by driving a whole herd over a cliff had made too much. They lived high for a while, then starved. Many of the great ruins that grace the deserts and jungles of the earth are monuments to progress traps, the headstones of civilizations which fell victim to their own success. In the fates of such societies, once mighty, complex, and brilliant, lie instructive lessons for our own. Their ruins are shipwrecks that mark the shoals of progress, or, to use a more modern analogy, they are fallen airliners whose black boxes can tell us what went wrong. In these talks, I want to read some of these boxes in the hope we can avoid repeating past mistakes of flight plan, crew selection, and design. Of course, our civilization's particulars differ from previous ones, but not as much as we like to think. All cultures, past and present, are dynamic. Even the most slow-moving were, in the long run, works in progress. While the facts of each case differ, the patterns through time are alarmingly and encouragingly similar. We should be alarmed by the predictability of our mistakes, but encouraged that this very fact makes them useful for understanding what we face today. Like Gauguin, we often prefer to think of the deep past as innocent and unspoiled, a time of ease and simple plenty. Eden and paradise feature prominently in popular book titles on anthropology and history. For some, Eden was the pre-agricultural world, the age of hunting and gathering. For others, it was the pre-Columbian world, the Americas before the white man. And for many, it was the pre-industrial world, the long stillness before the machine. Certainly, there have been good and bad times to be alive. But the truth is that human beings drove themselves out of Eden, and they've done it again and again by fouling their own nest. If we want to live in an earthly paradise, it is up to us to shape it, to share it, and look after it. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Bell Theater at Carleton University in Ottawa, you're listening to Gauguin's Questions, the first of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. In pondering his first question, where do we come from? Gauguin might have agreed with G.K. Chesterton, who remarked, if it is not true, that a divine being fell, then we can only say that one of the animals went entirely off its head. We now know much more about that five million year process of an ape going off its head. So it's hard nowadays to recapture the shock felt around the world when the implications of evolutionary theory first became clear. Writing in 1600, Shakespeare had Hamlet exclaim, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god. His audience would have shared Hamlet's mix of wonder, scorn, and irony at human nature, but very few, if any, 
would have doubted that they were made as the Bible told. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. They were prepared to overlook theological rough spots posed by sex, race, and hair color. Was God black or blonde? Did he have a navel? And what about the rest of his physical equipment? Such things didn't bear thinking about too closely. Our kinship with apes, which seems so obvious now, was unsuspected. Apes were seen, if seen, which was rarely in Europe in those days, as parodies of man, not cousins or possible forebears. If they thought about it at all, most people of 1600 believed that what we now call scientific method would simply open and illuminate the great clockwork set in place by providence, as God saw fit to let humans share in admiration of his handiwork. The inevitable collision between scriptural faith and empirical evidence was barely guessed at. Most of the really big surprises, the age of the earth, the origin of animals and man, the shape and scale of the heavens still lay ahead. Most people of 1600 were far more alarmed by priests and witches than by natural philosophers, though the lines between these three were often unclear. From the biblical definition of man and the common sense principle that it takes one to know one, Hamlet thinks he knows what a human being is, and most Westerners continued to think they knew what they were for another 200 years. The rot of rational doubt on the matter of our beginnings did not set in until the 19th century, when geologists realized that the chronology in the Bible could not account for the antiquity they read in rocks, fossils, and sediments. Some civilizations, notably the Hindu and the Maya, assumed that time was vast or infinite, but ours always had a petty notion of time's scale. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, sighs Rosalind in As You Like It. Half a century later, Archbishop Asher of Armagh and his contemporary John Lightfoot took it upon themselves to pinpoint the very moment of creation. Man was created by the Trinity, Lightfoot declared, on October the 23rd, 4004 BC, at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Such precision was new, but the idea of a young earth had always been essential to the Judeo-Christian view of time as teleological a short one-way trip from creation to judgment, from Adam to doom. Newton and other thinkers began to voice doubts about this on theoretical grounds, but they had no real evidence or means of testing their ideas. Then in the 1830s, while the young Charles Darwin was sailing around the world aboard the Beagle, Charles Lyell published his Principles of Geology arguing that the Earth transformed itself gradually by processes still at work and might therefore be as old as Newton had proposed, some ten times older than the Bible allowed. Under Queen Victoria, the Earth aged quickly. <laughs> by many millions of years in decades, enough to make room for Darwin's evolutionary mechanism and the growing collection of giant lizards and low-browed fossil humans being dug up around the world. In 1863, Lyle brought out a book called Geological Evidences of the Antiquity of Man. And in 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man. Their ideas were spread by enthusiastic popularizers. Above all, Thomas Huxley, famous for saying in a debate on evolution with Bishop Wilberforce, that he would rather acknowledge an ape for his grandfather than be a clergyman careless with the truth. Hamlet's exclamation, therefore, became a question. What exactly is a man? Like children who reach an age when they're no longer satisfied that a stork brought them into the world, a newly educated public began to doubt the old mythology. By the time Gauguin was painting his masterpiece at the end of the century, 
The first two of his questions were getting concrete answers. By 1907, Boltwood and Rutherford could show that the Earth's age is reckoned not in millions of years, but in billions. Archaeology showed that the genus Homo was a latecomer, even among mammals, taking shape long after early pigs, cats, and elephants began walking the Earth, or in the case of whales, gave up walking and went swimming. Man, wrote H.G. Wells, is a mere upstart. What was extraordinary about human development, the one big thing that set us apart from other creatures, is that we leveraged natural evolution by developing cultures transmissible through speech from one generation to the next. The human word, Northrop Fry wrote in another context, is the power that orders our chaos. The effect of this power was unprecedented, allowing complex tools, weapons, and elaborate planned behaviors. Even very simple technology had enormous consequences. Basic clothing and built shelter, for example, opened up every climate from the tropics to the tundra. We moved beyond the ecologies that had made us and began to make ourselves. But though we became experimental creatures of our own devising, it's important to bear in mind that we had no inkling of this process, let alone its consequences, until only the last six or seven of our 100,000 generations. We've done it all sleepwalking. Nature let a few apes into the lab of evolution, switched on the lights, and left us there to mess about with an ever-growing supply of ingredients and processes. The effect on us and on the world has accumulated ever since. What strikes me most forcefully is the acceleration, the runaway progression of change, or, to put it another way, the collapsing of time. From the first chipped stone to the first smelted iron took nearly three million years. From that first iron to the hydrogen bomb took only 3,000. The old Stone Age, or Paleolithic era, lasted from the appearance of tool-making hominids nearly three million years ago until the melting of the last Ice Age only 12,000 years ago. It therefore spans more than 99.5% of human existence. During most of that time, the pace of change was so slow that entire cultural traditions replicated themselves generation after generation, almost identically, over staggering periods of time. It might take 100,000 years for a new style or technique to be developed. Then, as culture began to ramify and feed on itself, only 10,000, then mere thousands, and centuries. Cultural change begat physical change, and vice versa. Now we have reached such a pass that the skills and mores we learn in childhood are outdated by the time we're 30. But I'm getting ahead in the story. Most people living in the old Stone Age would not have noticed any cultural change at all. The human world that individuals entered at birth was the same as the one they left at death. It's possible to imagine exceptions to what I've just said. The generation that saw the first use of fire, for instance, was perhaps aware that its world had changed. But we can't be sure how quickly even that Promethean discovery took hold. Most likely, fire was used when available from wildfires and volcanoes for a long time before it was kept. And then it was kept for a very long time before anyone learned it could be made. Some may remember the 1981 film, Quest for Fire, in which the lithe figure of Ray Dawn Chong scampers about in nothing but a thin layer of mud and ashes. The film was based on a novel published in 1911 by the Belgian J.H. Rosny, and his original title was The War for Fire. The book, more than the film, depicts deadly competition between various human groups to monopolize fire in much the same way that modern nations try to monopolize nuclear weapons. Throughout the hundreds of centuries when our ancestors tended a flame but could not make one, putting out their rivals' campfire in an Ice Age winter 
would have been a deed of mass murder. The first taming of fire is hard to date. All we know is that people were using fire by at least half a million years ago, possibly twice that. This was the time of Homo erectus, the upright man, who was much like us from the neck down, but whose brain case had only about two-thirds the modern capacity. Anthropologists are still debating when Homo erectus first appeared and when he and she were superseded, which is largely a matter of defining that evolutionary stage. Scholars are even more divided on how well erectus could think and speak. Modern apes, whose brains are much smaller than those of erectus, can use simple tools, have wide knowledge of medicinal plants, and can recognize themselves in a mirror. It is clear that different groups of the same species, for example, chimps in separate parts of Africa, have different habits and traditions passed on to the young, just as in human groups. In short, apes have the beginnings of culture. So do other intelligent creatures, such as whales, elephants, and certain birds. But no species, except humankind, has reached the takeoff point at which culture becomes the main driver of an evolutionary surge, outrunning environmental and physical constraints. The bloodlines of man and ape split about five million years ago, and as I mentioned, hominids making crude stone tools appear some two million years after that. It would therefore be foolish to underestimate the skills of Homo erectus, who, by the time he was toasting his calloused feet at a campfire half a million years ago, was nine-tenths of the way along the road from an ancestral ape to us. About the last big thing the experts agree on is that Homo erectus originated in Africa, the home of all the early hominids, and by a million years ago was living in several temperate and tropical zones of the old world, the contiguous Eurasian landmass. This isn't to say the upright man was thick on the ground, even after he tamed fire. Perhaps fewer than 100,000 people, scattered in family bands, were all that stood between evolutionary failure and the six billion of us here today. After Homo erectus, the evolutionary path gets muddy, trodden into a mire by rival tribes of anthropologists. <laughs> One anthropological camp sees Homo erectus evolving by fits and starts into modern humanity wherever he happened to be through gene diffusion, otherwise known as mating with strangers. <laughs> this view seems to fit well with many of the fossil finds, but less well with some interpretations of DNA. Another camp, known as the Out of Africa School, sees most evolutionary change taking place on that continent only, then erupting over the rest of the world. In this second view, successive waves of new and improved humans kill off, or at any rate, outcompete their forerunners wherever they find them until all the lowbrows are gone. This theory implies that each new wave of African man was a separate species, unable to breed with other descendants of the previous kind, which may be plausible if different types evolve without contact for long periods, but is less likely over the shorter spans of time. The debate over the path of human progress gets most heated when we reach our controversial cousins, the Neanderthals. These lived mainly in Europe and Northwest Asia in quite recent times, well within the last 1 20th of the human journey. In very round figures, Neanderthals appear about 130,000 years ago and disappear about 100,000 years later. Their arrival date is less certain than their departure. But it seems they evolved at about the same time as early examples of what is thought to be our modern kind, often called Cro-Magnon, after a rock shelter in the lovely Dordogne region of southern France, where the human fossil record is the richest in the world. Ever since they were first identified, Neanderthals have been the butt of what I call paleo-racism, <laughs> lampooned as cartoon cavemen, a subhuman knuckle-dragging breed. H.G. Wells called them the grizzly folk and made an unflattering guess at how they might have looked. 
an extreme hairiness, an ugliness, a repulsive strangeness. Many have claimed that Neanderthals were cannibals, which could be true, for so are we. Later humans have a long record of cannibalism right down to modern times. The first Neanderthal skeleton was unearthed in 1856 from a cave in a valley near Dusseldorf, Germany. The place had been named after the composer Joachim Neumann, who had rather effectively rendered his surname into Greek as Neander. English, Neanderthal is simply Newmandale. Fitting enough, a new man had indeed come to light in the dale, a new man at least 30,000 years old. Not that Neanderthal man's seniority was recognized immediately. The French, noting the skull's thickness, were inclined to think it had belonged to a German. <laughs> the Germans said it was most likely from a Slav, a, a Cossack mercenary who had crawled into the cave and died. But just three years later, in 1859, two things happened. Darwin published On the Origin of Species, and Charles Lyell, visiting the gravels of the river Somme to become infamous, not 60 years later as a human slaughterhouse, recognized chip flints as weapons from the Ice Age. Once the scientists of the day acknowledged that the Neanderthaler wasn't a Cossack, they cast him in the newly minted role of the missing link. The new man became the right man at the right time the one who would show the unthinkable, that humans were animals. It was assumed that he had little or no power of speech, ran like a baboon, and walked on the outsides of his feet. But as more bones were unearthed and analyzed, this view didn't stand up. The most ape-like skeletons were found to be sufferers from osteoarthritis, severely crippled individuals who had evidently been supported for years by their community. Evidence also came to light that the so-called grizzly folk had not only cared for their sick, but also buried their dead with religious rites, with flowers and ochre and animal horns, the first people on earth known to do so. And last but not least, the Neanderthal brain turned out to be bigger than our own. So perhaps Homo neanderthalensis was really not so brutish after all. Perhaps he deserved to be promoted to a subspecies of modern man, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. And if that were so, the two variants could, by definition, have interbred. Before the two began to compete in Europe, the Cro-Magnons lived south of the Mediterranean and the Neanderthals north. Then, as now, the Middle East was a crossroads. Dwelling sites in that turbulent region show occupation by both Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons beginning about 100,000 years ago. We can't tell whether they ever lived there at exactly the same times, let alone whether they shared the Holy Land harmoniously. Most likely, their arrangement was a kind of timeshare, with Neanderthals moving south out of Europe during especially cold spells, and Cro-Magnons moving north from Africa whenever the climate warmed. What is most interesting is that the material culture of the two groups, as shown by their artifacts, was identical over a span of more than 50,000 years. I take this as strong evidence that the two groups had very similar mental and linguistic capabilities, and that neither was more primitive or less evolved. No Neanderthal flesh, skin, or hair has yet come to light. So we can't say whether these people were brown or blonde, hairy as Esau, or smooth as Jacob. Nor do we know much about the Cro-Magnon's superficial appearance. We know them only by their bones. Both were roughly the same height, with the usual variation between sexes. But the Neanderthal was heavy-set and brawny, like a professional weightlifter or wrestler. The Cro-Magnon was slighter and more gracile, a track athlete rather than a bodybuilder. It's hard to know how far these differences were innate and how much they reflected habitat and lifestyle. In 1939, the anthropologist Carlton Kuhn drew an amusing reconstruction of a Neanderthal cleaned up, shaved, 
and dressed in a fedora jacket and tie. Such a man, Kuhn remarked, might pass unnoticed on the New York subway. As such analogies suggest, the variation between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon skeletons does not fall far outside the range of modern humans. Put side by side, the bony remains of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Woody Allen might exhibit <laughs> and <laughs> might exhibit an even greater contrast. <laughs> the skull, however, is another matter. The so-called classic Neanderthal had a long, low skull with strong brow ridges in front and a bony ledge across the nape of the neck known as the Neanderthal bun. The jaw was robust, the nose broad and presumably squat. At first glance, the design looks archaic. But as noted, the Neanderthal brain was bigger on average than the Cro-Magnon. Carlton Kuhn's subway rider had a thick skull, but not necessarily a thick head. What this adds up to, I think, is that the supposedly archaic characteristics of the Neanderthal were in fact an overlay of cold climate adaptations on an essentially modern human frame. Thick-set, brawny people don't lose body heat as quickly as slender people. Signs of similar adaptation, in body shape at least, can be seen among modern Inuit, Andeans, and Himalayans, and this after only a few thousand years of living with intense cold, beside the hundred thousand during which Europe's Neanderthals made their living on the front lines of the Ice Age. Things seemed to have gone well enough for them until Cro-Magnons began moving north and west from the Middle East about 40,000 years ago. Until then, the cold had been the, ne the Neanderthals' great ally, always turning invaders back sooner or later. But this time, the Cro-Magnons came to stay. The invasion seems to have coincided with climatic instability linked to sudden reversals of ocean currents that caused freezing and thawing of the North Atlantic in upsets as short as a decade. Such sharp changes, severe as the worst predictions we now have for global warming, would have devastated animal and plant communities on which the Neanderthals depended. Climate change would have made life difficult for everyone, of course, but the unstable conditions could have given the edge to the less physically specialized, weaker at close quarters, but quicker on their feet. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Bell Theatre at Carleton University in Ottawa, you're listening to Gauguin's Questions, the first of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. I remember seeing a cartoon when I was a schoolboy, I think it was in Punch, showing three or four bratty Neanderthal children standing on a cliff, badgering their father. Daddy, Daddy, can we go and throw rocks at the Cro-Magnons today? <laughs> For about 10 millennia, from 40,000 to 30,000 years ago, the late Neanderthals and the early European Cro-Magnons probably did throw rocks at each other, not to mention dousing campfires, stealing game, and perhaps seizing women and children. At the end of that unimaginably long struggle, Europe and the whole world belonged to our kind, and the classic Neanderthal was gone forever. But what really happened? Did the Neanderthal line die out, or was it to some degree assimilated? The 10,000-year struggle was so gradual that it may have been scarcely perceptible a fitful, inconclusive war with land lost and won at the rate of a few miles in a lifetime. Yet, like all wars, it sparked innovation. New tools and weapons appear, new clothing and rituals, the beginnings of cave painting, an art form that would reach its height during the last great fling of the Ice Age after the classic Neanderthals had gone. We also know that cultural contact went both ways, Late Neanderthal sites in France show change and adaptation at a pace never seen before. By then, near the end, the war's implications must have become dreadfully clear. It seems that the last Neanderthal bands held out in the mountains of Spain and Yugoslavia, driven like Apaches into rougher and rougher terrain. 
If the warfare picture I've sketched has any truth to it, then we face unpalatable conclusions. And this is what makes the Neanderthal debate so emotional. It is not only about ancient people, but about ourselves. If it turns out that the Neanderthals disappeared because they were an evolutionary dead end, we can merely shrug and blame natural selection for their fate. But if they were, in fact, a variant or race of modern man, then we must admit to ourselves that their death may have been the first genocide. Or worse, not the first, merely the first of which any evidence remains. It may follow from this that we are descended from a million years of ruthless victories, genetically predisposed by the sins of our fathers to do likewise again and again. As the anthropologist Milford Wolpoff has written on this period, you can't imagine one human population replacing another except through violence. No, you can't, especially not on the blood-stained earth of Europe amid Stone Age forebodings of the final solution and the slaughters of the Somme. In the aftermath of the Second World War, William Golding explored ancient genocide in his extraordinary novel, The Inheritors. The book's epigraph from H.G. Wells invokes Neanderthals, though the anthropological specifics fit better with much earlier stages of mankind. Yet Golding's anachronisms don't matter. His people may not fit any particular set of bones from the real past, but they stand for many. In the course of a few spring days, the supposedly more primitive folk are invaded for the first time by people like us, who, with their boats, bonfires, arrows, raucous voices, wholesale tree felling, and drunken orgies, baffle and fascinate the forest devils, as they call them, even as they kill them one by one. At the end, only a mewling baby survives, kept by a woman who has lost her own child to drain the milk from her breasts. The invaders then move on through the new land, their leader plotting further murders, murders now amongst themselves. Golding had no doubt that the ruthless were the winners of prehistory. But another question he raised is still unsettled. Does any Neanderthal blood flow in modern humans? How likely is it that during 10,000 years of interaction, there was no sex, unconsensual though it may have been? And if there was sex, were there children? DNA studies on Neanderthal remains have been inconclusive so far. But the skeleton of a child found recently in Portugal strongly suggests interbreeding as do bones from Croatia and elsewhere in the Balkans. I also have personal evidence that Neanderthal genes may still be with us. A few modern people have telltale ridges on their heads, and I happen to have one. <laughs> a, a bony shelf across the back of the skull that looks and feels exactly like the Neanderthal bun. So until new findings come along to settle the matter, I choose to believe that Neanderthal blood still flows, however faint, in the Cro-Magnon tide. Despite the many details of our ancestry still to be worked out, the 20th century did broadly answer the first two of Gauguin's questions. There is no room for rational doubt that we are apes, and that regardless of our exact route through time, we come ultimately from Africa. But unlike other apes, we tamper, and are tampering more than ever with our destiny. For a long time now, there has been no such thing as that enlightenment wild goose which Gauguin sought, the natural man. Like those arthritic Neanderthals who were cared for by their families, we cannot live without our cultures. We have met the maker of Hamlet's piece of work, and it is us. Thank you very much.
on Ideas Tonight from the Bell Theatre at Carleton University in Ottawa, you've been listening to Gauguin's Questions, the first of the 2004 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright, and the lecture series is called A Short History of Progress. Tomorrow night's lecture, The Great Experiment, will come from the Meyer Horowitz Theatre at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. The 2004 Massey Lectures are published as a book by the House of Anansi Press, and Ronald Wright is taking part in an online forum to discuss the lectures at www.anansi.ca. You can purchase the Massey Lectures either as a book or a CD by calling Ideas Transcripts and using your credit card. The number to call is 416-205-7367. Taxes and shipping are included, and the book costs $23.95. The five CDs sell in stores for $49.95, but you can buy it through Ideas Transcripts for the special price of $44.95, which also includes taxes and shipping. Again, the number to call is 416 416- 205-7367. Tonight's lecture was recorded by Shane Bryanton. Our partners in the Massey Lectures are the House of Anansi Press and Massey College in the University of Toronto. The Massey Lectures were produced for Ideas by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht, and I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned to CBC Radio 1 for the hourly news, followed by the Arts Tonight and Between the Covers. Good evening, and welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy, and tonight we're in Edmonton, Alberta, on this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. The beautiful Meyer Horowitz Theatre here on the campus of the University of Alberta is packed to the roof. There are over 700 people here tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the second of this year's Massey Lectures, called A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country, what it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. 
This year, the Massey lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cutstones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight, from the Meyer Horowitz Theater at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, The Great Experiment, the second of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. It's not only a great honor to be asked to do the Massey Lectures for me, for me, but it's also a real pleasure to be back here in the West, because even though I grew up in England, uh, my father was from Kelowna, B.C., and um, when I first came to Canada uh, to go into grad school in archaeology, I uh, went straight to that other city down the road uh, <laughs> here in Alberta. Also, actually, when I started writing uh, my own things, one of the first things I did was uh, a, a series uh, for ideas 20 years ago, which was produced here uh, at CBC Edmonton. So it's been very nostalgic. I've been here for a couple of days, uh, and uh, it's been very nostalgic, walking around old haunts and seeing old friends. Anyhow, uh, on to the second Massey Lecture, uh, which is also the second chapter in the book, because the, the book chapters are essentially the same as these lectures and I called it The Great Experiment. Someone fond of logical absurdities once defined specialists as people who know more and more about less and less until they know all about nothing. <laughs> Many uh, animals are highly specialized, their bodies adapted to specific ecological niches and ways of life. Specialization brings short-term rewards, but can lead in the long run to an evolutionary dead end. When the prey of the saber-toothed cat died out, so did the cat. The modern human animal, our physical being, is a generalist. We have no fangs, claws, or venom built into our bodies. Instead, we have tools and weapons, knives, spearheads, poisoned arrows. Even elementary inventions, such as warm clothing and simple watercraft, allowed us to overrun the whole planet before the end of the last ice age. Our specialization is the brain. The flexibility of the brain's interactions with nature through culture has been the key to our success. Cultures can adapt far more quickly than genes can to new threats and needs. But as I suggested in the previous talk, there is still a risk. As cultures grow more elaborate and technologies more powerful, they themselves may become ponderous specializations, vulnerable, and in extreme cases, deadly. The atomic bomb, a logical progression from the arrow and the bullet, became the first technology to threaten our species with extinction. It's what I call a progress trap. But much simpler technologies have also seduced and ruined societies in the past, even back in the Stone Age. In the previous lecture, I raised three questions asked by the painter Paul Gauguin in his great 1897 canvas entitled, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? At a practical level, anthropology has answered the first two. We now know that we are the remote descendants of apes who lived in Africa about five million years ago. Modern apes who are also descended from uh, the same original stock are kin, but not direct ancestors. They're also descendants. Our main difference from chimps and gorillas is that over the last three million years or so, we have been shaped less and less by nature and more and more by culture. We have become experimental creatures of our own making. Now, this experiment has never been tried before, 
and we, its unwitting authors, have never controlled it. The experiment is now moving very quickly and on a colossal scale. Since the early 1900s, the world's population has multiplied by four, and its economy, which is a rough measure of the human load on nature, by more than 40. We have reached a stage where we must bring the experiment under rational control and guard against present and potential dangers. It's entirely up to us. If we fail, if we blow up or degrade the biosphere so it can no longer sustain us, nature will merely shrug and conclude that letting apes run the laboratory was fun for a while, but in the end, a bad idea. (laughs) We have already caused so many extinctions of other species, that our dominion over the Earth will appear in the fossil record like the impact of an asteroid. So far, we are only a small asteroid compared with the one that clobbered the dinosaurs. But if the extinctions continue much longer, or if we unleash weapons of mass destruction, I mean the real ones kept in huge stockpiles (laughs) by the great powers, then the next layer of fossils will indeed show a major hiatus in this planet's life. I suggested in a previous talk that prehistory, like history, tells us that the nice folk didn't win, that we are at best the heirs of many ruthless victories and at worst the heirs of genocide. We may well be descended from humans who repeatedly exterminated rival humans culminating in the suspicious death of our Neanderthal cousins some 30,000 years ago. Whatever the truth of that event, it marks the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic period, the last and briefest of three divisions in the Old Stone Age, about one hundredth of the whole. In this talk, I want to see what we can deduce from the first progress trap, the perfection of hunting, which ended the Old Stone Age and how our escape from that trap by the invention of farming led to our greatest experiment, worldwide civilization. We then have to ask ourselves this urgent question. Could civilization itself be another and much deadlier trap? The old Stone Age began nearly three million years ago with the first rough tools made by the first rough beasts slouching towards humanity and ended only 12,000 years ago when the great ice sheets withdrew for the last time to the poles and ranges where they await further climate change. Geologically speaking, three million years is only a wink, one minute of Earth's day. But in human terms, the old Stone Age is a deep abyss of time, more than 99.5% of our existence from which we crawled into the soft beds of civilization only yesterday. Even our modern subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens, is between 10 and 20 times older than the oldest civilization. But measured as subjective human experience, as a sum of individual lives, more people have lived a civilized life than any other. Civilization doesn't run deep in time but it runs wide, for it is both the cause and the effect of a population boom that has yet to level off. I should make it clear that I'm defining civilization and culture in a technical, anthropological way. By culture, I mean the whole of any society's knowledge, beliefs, and practices. Culture is everything, from veganism to cannibalism, Beethoven, Botticelli, body piercing, what you do in the bedroom, the bathroom, and the church of your choice, if your culture allows a choice, and all of technology from the split stone to the split atom. Civilizations are a specific kind of culture, large, complex societies based on the domestication of plants, animals, and human beings. Civilizations vary in their makeup but typically have towns, cities, governments, social classes, and specialized professions. All civilizations are cultures or conglomerates of cultures, but not all cultures are civilizations. 
Archaeologists generally agree that the first civilizations were those of Sumer in southern Mesopotamia, or what is now Iraq, and Egypt, both emerging about 3000 BC. By 1000 BC, civilizations ringed the world, notably in India, China, Mexico, Peru, and parts of Europe. From ancient times until today, civilized people have believed they behave better, indeed are better, than so-called savages. But the moral values attached to civilization are specious, too often used to justify attacking and dominating other less powerful societies. In their imperial heyday, the French had their civilizing mission and the British their white man's burden, the bearing of which was eased by automatic weapons. As Hilaire Belloc wrote in 1898, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. <laughs> Nowadays, Washington claims to lead and safeguard the civilized world, a tradition in American rhetoric that began with the uprooting and exterminating of that country's first inhabitants. The Roman circus, the Aztec sacrifices, the Inquisition bonfires, the Nazi death camps, all have been the work of highly civilized societies. In the 20th century alone, at least 100 million people, mostly civilians, died in wars. Savages have done no worse. At the gates of the Colosseum and the concentration camp, we have no choice but to abandon hope that civilization is in itself a guarantor of moral progress. When Mahatma Gandhi came to England in the 1930s for talks on Indian self-rule, a reporter asked him what he thought of Western civilization. Gandhi, who had just visited the London slums, replied, I think it would be a very good idea. If I sound at times rather hard on civilization, this is because, like Gandhi, I would like it to fulfill its promise and succeed. I would rather live in a house than a rock shelter. I like great buildings and good books. I like knowing that I'm an ape, that the world is round, that the sun is a star and the stars are suns. Taken for granted knowledge that took thousands of years to rest from chaos and old night. For all its cruelties, civilization is precious, an experiment worth continuing. It is also precarious. As we climb the ladder of progress, we kicked out the rungs below. There is no going back without catastrophe. Those who don't like civilization and can't wait for it to fall on its arrogant face should keep in mind that there is no other way to support humanity in anything like our present numbers or estate. The old Stone Age now seems so remote that we seldom give it a thought except perhaps to chuckle at a far side cartoon. Yet it ended so recently, only six times further back than the birth of Christ and the Roman Empire, that the big changes since we left the cave have all been cultural, not physical. A long-lived species like ours by that I mean a species whose individuals have long lives, can't evolve significantly over so short an interval. This means that while culture and technology are cumulative, innate intelligence is not. Like the butt of Dr. Johnson's joke that much may be made of a Scotsman if he be caught young, <laughs> a late Paleolithic child snatched from a campfire and raised amongst us now, would have an even chance at earning a degree in astrophysics or computer science. To use a computer analogy, we're running 21st century software on hardware last upgraded 50,000 years ago or more. <laughs> this may explain quite a lot of what we see in the news. <laughs> Culture itself has created this uniquely human problem, partly because cultural growth runs far ahead of evolution, and because for a long time now, the accreting mass of culture has forestalled natural selection 
and put destiny into our hands. I will tell you what a man is, wrote William Golding in his 1956 novel, Pincher Martin, which, though set during the Second World War, continues the meditation on humanity that he began in his Stone Age novel, The Inheritors. He is a freak, an ejected fetus robbed of his natural development, thrown out in the world with a naked covering of parchment, with too little room for his teeth and a soft, bulging skull like a bubble. But nature stirs a pudding there. In Golding's pudding seethe many ingredients, genius and madness, logic and belief, instinct and hallucination, compassion and cruelty, love, hate, sex, art, greed, all the drives towards life and death. In the individual, the sum of these is personality. In society, it is the collective personality called culture. In the long run, the pudding of culture has always grown in size, if not always in quality, and there have been several yeasty times when it rose quite suddenly and spilled across the kitchen. The first of these was the taming of fire by Homo erectus, which tipped the balance of survival strongly in our favor. The next, half a million years later, was the perfection of hunting by Cro-Magnons soon after they displaced the Neanderthals. New weapons were produced, lighter, sharper, longer ranged, more elegant and deadly. Bead adornment, bone carvings, musical instruments, and elaborate burials became common. Magnificent paintings appeared on cave walls and rock faces in a vigorous naturalism that would not be seen again until the Renaissance. Many of these things had already been done on a small scale by Neanderthals and earlier Cro-Magnons. So this spurt of art and technology cannot, as some claim, be evidence that we suddenly evolved into a new species with brand new cognitive powers. But it is evidence of a familiar cultural pattern, leisure born of a food surplus. The hunters and gatherers were producing more than mere subsistence, giving themselves time to paint the walls, make beads and effigies, play music, indulge in religious rituals. For the first time, people were rich. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Meyer Horowitz Theater at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, you're listening to The Great Experiment, the second of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. To draw a rough analogy between two unconnected eras of very different length and complexity, there are certain resemblances between this end time of the old Stone Age and the past half millennium of Western discovery and conquest. Since 1492, one kind of civilization, the European, has largely destroyed and displaced all others, fattening and remaking itself into an industrial force in the process, a point I shall return to in the last lecture in this series. During the Upper Paleolithic, one kind of human, the Cro-Magnon or Homo sapiens sapiens, multiplied and fanned out around the world, killing, displacing, or absorbing all other variants of man, then entering new worlds that had never felt a human foot before. By 15,000 years ago, at the very latest, long before the ice withdraws, humankind is established on every continent except Antarctica. Like the worldwide expansion of Europe, this prehistoric wave of discovery and migration had profound ecological consequences. Soon after man shows up in new lands, the big game starts to go missing. Mammoths and woolly rhinos retreat north, then vanish from Europe and Asia. A giant wombat, other marsupials, and a tortoise as big as a Volkswagen disappear from Australia. Camels, mammoth, giant bison, giant sloth, and the horse die out across the Americas. A bad smell of extinction 
follows Homo sapiens around the world. Not all experts agree that our ancestors were solely to blame. Our defenders point out that we hunted in Africa, Asia, and Europe for a million years or more without killing everything off, that many of these extinctions coincide with climatic upheavals, that the end of the Ice Age may have come so swiftly that big animals couldn't adapt or migrate. Now, these are good objections, and it would be unwise to rule them out entirely. Yet the evidence against our ancestors is, I think, overwhelming. Undoubtedly, animals were stressed by the melting of the ice, but they had made it through many similar warmings before. It's also true that earlier people, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and early Homo sapiens, had hunted big game without hunting it out. But upper Paleolithic people were far better equipped and more numerous than their forerunners, and they killed on a much grander scale. Some of their slaughter sites were almost industrial in size, a thousand mammoths at one, more than a hundred thousand horses at another. The Neanderthals were surely able and valiant in the chase, wrote the anthropologist William Howells in 1960, but they left no such massive boneyards as this. And the ecological moral is underlined more recently by Ian Tattersall. Like us, he says, the Cro-Magnons must have had a darker side. In steep terrain, these relentless hunters drove entire herds over cliffs, leaving piles of animals to rot, a practice that continued into historic times at places such as Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump in southern Alberta. Luckily for bison, cliffs are rare on the Great Plains. <laughs> but there would be no limit to the white man's guns that reduced both buffalo and Indian to near extinction in a few decades of the 19th century. The humped herds of buffalo, wrote Herman Melville, not 40 years ago, overspread by tens of thousands, the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch. Land at a dollar an inch, that's civilization. Modern hunter-gatherers, Amazonians, Australian Aboriginals, Inuit, Kalahari Bushmen, are wise stewards of their ecologies, limiting their own numbers, treading lightly on the land. And it's often assumed that ancient hunters would have been equally wise, but the hard evidence doesn't support this view. Paleolithic hunting was the mainstream livelihood, done in the richest environments on a seemingly boundless earth. And done, we have to infer from the profligate remains, with the stock traders' optimism that there would always be another big killing just over the next hill. In the best documented mass extinctions, the loss of flightless birds and other animals from New Zealand and Madagascar, there is no room for doubt that people were to blame. The Australian biologist Tim Flannery has called human beings the future eaters. Each extermination is a death of possibility. So among the things we need to know about ourselves is that the Upper Paleolithic, which may well have begun in genocide, ended with an all-you-can-kill wildlife barbecue. The perfection of hunting spelled the end of hunting as a way of life. Easy meat meant more babies. More babies meant more hunters. More hunters, sooner or later, meant less game. Most of the great human migrations across the world at this time must have been driven by want as we bankrupted the land with our movable feasts. The archaeology of Western Europe during the final millennia of the Paleolithic shows the grand lifestyle of the Cro-Magnons falling away. Their cave painting falters and stops. Sculptures and carvings become rare. The flint blades grow smaller and smaller. Instead of killing mammoth, they're shooting rabbits. In a 1930s essay called In Praise of Clumsy People, the waggish Czech writer Karel Čapek observed, man ceased to be a mere hunter when individuals were born who were very bad hunters. And as someone once said of Wagner's music, 
Chapek's remark is better than it sounds. <laughs> the hunters at the end of the Old Stone Age were certainly not clumsy, but they were bad because they broke rule one for any prudent parasite. Don't kill off your host. As they drove species after species to extinction, they walked into the first progress trap. Some of their descendants, the hunter-gatherer societies that have survived into recent times, would learn in the school of hard knocks to restrain themselves. But the rest of us found a new way to raise the stakes, that great change known to hindsight as the farming or Neolithic revolution. Among hunters, there had always been a large number of non-hunters, the gatherers, mainly women and children, we suppose, responsible for the wild fruits and vegetables in the diet of a well-run cave. Their contribution to the food supply became more and more important as the game died out. The people of that short, sharp period known as the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age tried everything, living in estuaries and bogs, beachcombing, grubbing up roots, and reaping wild grasses for the tiny seeds, a practice with enormous implications. So rich were some of these grasses, and so labor-intensive their exploitation, that settled villages appear in key areas before farming. Gatherers began to notice that seeds accidentally scattered or passed in droppings would spring up the following year. They began to influence the outcome by tending and enlarging wild stands, by sowing the most easily reaped and plumpest seeds. Such experiments would eventually lead to full agriculture and almost total dependence on a few monotonous staples, but that was several thousand years away. At this early time, the plant tenders were still mainly gatherers, exploiting a great variety of flora as well as any wild game and fish they could find. At Monte Verde in Chile, for example, a permanent village of rectangular wooden huts was in place by 13,000 years ago, sustained by hunting camels, small game, and soon to be extinct mastodon. But the remains also include many wild vegetables, not least potato peelings. Although Monte Verde is one of the earliest human sites anywhere in the Americas, it shows a mature and intimate knowledge of local plants several of which would eventually become the founding crops of Andean civilization. Like the accumulation of small changes that separated us from the other great apes, the farming revolution was an unconscious experiment, too gradual for its initiators to be aware of it, let alone to foresee where it would lead. But compared with all earlier developments, it happened at breakneck speed highly important for what it tells us about ourselves is that there was not one revolution, but many. On every continent except Australia, farming experiments began soon after the regime of the ice released its grip. Older books, and some recent ones, emphasize the importance of the Middle East or Fertile Crescent, which stretched from the Mediterranean shore to the Anatolian Plateau and the alluvial plains of Iraq. All the bread-based civilizations derive their staples from this area, which gave us wheat, barley, sheep, and goats. But it's now clear that the Middle East was only one of at least four major regions of the world where agriculture developed independently at about the same time. The others are the Far East, where rice and millet became the main staples, Mesoamerica, which uh, means Mexico and neighboring parts of Central America, whose civilizations were based on maize, beans, squashes, amaranth, and tomatoes, and the Andean region of South America, which developed many kinds of potato, other tubers, squash, cotton, peanuts, and high-protein grains such as quinoa. In all these heartlands, crop domestication appears between eight and 10,000 years ago, Besides these big four, there are also about a dozen lesser founding areas around the world. Unconnected people sometimes develop the same plants. Cotton and peanuts are each of two kinds, developed simultaneously in the new world and the old. 
animal domestication is harder to document, but at about the same time people were developing crops, they learned that certain herbivores and birds could be followed, corralled, and killed at a sustainable rate. Over generations, these animals grew tame enough and dim-witted enough not to mind the two-legged serial killer who followed them around. <laughs> Hunting became herding, just as gathering grew into gardening. Sheep and goats were the first true domesticates in the Middle East, starting about 8,000 BC. Domestic camelids, early forms of the llama and alpaca, used for pack trains and wool as well as meat, appear in Peru during the 6th millennium BC, about the same time as cattle in Eurasia, though neither camelids nor early cattle were milked. Donkeys and horses were tamed by about 4,000 BC. Craftier creatures such as dogs, pigs, and cats had long been willing to hang around human settlements in return for scraps, slops, and the mouse boom spurred by granaries. Dogs, which may have been tamed for hunting back in the Paleolithic, are found with human groups throughout the world. In cold weather, they were sometimes used as bed warmers, which some experts believe accounts for the expression three-dog night. <laughs> Actually, that's not a joke, it's true. <laughs> not in places such as Korea and Mexico, special breeds were kept for meat. The chicken began its sad march towards the moor of Colonel Sanders <laughs> as a gorgeously feathered Asian jungle fowl, while Mexico developed the turkey. Along with the llama and alpaca, Peruvians kept Muscovy ducks and the lowly but prolific guinea pig, which even made a cameo appearance on the menu of Christ's Last Supper in a colonial Peruvian painting. As the eating of guinea pigs and chihuahuas suggests, the Americas were less well endowed with domesticable animals than the old world. But the new world compensated by developing a wider and more productive range of plants. Peru alone had nearly 40 major species. Such plants eventually supported huge native cities in the Americas, and several of them would transform the old world's nutrition and economics when they were introduced there a matter I shall discuss in the final lecture. The more predictable the food supply, the bigger the population. Unlike mobile foragers, sedentary people had little reason to limit the number of children who were useful for field and household tasks. The reproductive rate of women tended to rise, owing to higher levels of body fat and earlier weaning with animal milk and cereal baby food. Farmers soon outnumbered hunter-gatherers, absorbing, killing, or driving them into the surrounding wilderness. At the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic, when our modern subspecies emerged by fair means or foul as the Earth's inheritors, we numbered perhaps a third of a million, all told. By 10,000 years ago, on the eve of agriculture, and after settling all habitable continents, we'd increased to about three million. And by 5,000 years ago, when farming was established in all, found, all the founding regions and full civilization had already begun in Sumer and Egypt, we may have reached between 50 and 20 million people worldwide. Such figures are merely educated guesswork. And everything else I've just said is, of course, an oversimplification. The change to full-time farming took millennia and early results were not always promising, even in a core zone such as the Middle East. Neolithic Jericho was tiny, a mere four acres in 8,000 BC, and took another 1,500 years to reach 10 acres. The Turkish site of Çatal Hüyük, the largest settlement in the Fertile Crescent between 7,000 and 5,500 BC, covered only 1 20th of a square mile, or 32 acres and its inhabitants depended on wild game for much of their protein. As any rural Canadian knows, hunting continues among farmers wherever it's fun or worthwhile. And this was especially true in the Americas and parts of Asia where domestic animals were scarce. Nevertheless, the pace of growth accelerated. By about 5,000 years ago, the majority of human beings had made the transition from wild food to tame. 
In the magnitude of its consequences, no other invention rivals farming, except since 1940, the invention of weapons that can kill us all. The human career divides in two. Everything before the Neolithic Revolution and everything after it. Although the three Stone Ages, Old, Middle, and New, may seem to belong in a set, they don't. The New Stone Age has much more in common with later ages than with the millions of years of stone toolery that went before it. The farming revolution produced an entirely new mode of subsistence, which remains the basis of the world economy to this day. The food technology of the late Stone Age is the one technology we cannot live without. The crops of about a dozen ancient peoples feed the six billion on Earth today. Despite more than two centuries of scientific crop breeding, despite the so-called green revolution of the 1960s and the genetic engineering of the 1990s, not one new staple has been added to our repertoire of crops since prehistoric times. Although the new Stone Age eventually gave way to metalworking in several parts of the world and to the Industrial Revolution in Europe, these were elaborations on the same theme not a fundamental shift in subsistence. A Neolithic village was much like a Bronze Age or an Iron Age village, or a modern Third World village for that matter. The Victorian archaeological scheme of classifying stages of human development by tool materials becomes unhelpful from the Neolithic onward. It may have some merit in Europe, where technology was often linked to social change, but is little help for understanding what happened in places where a lack of the things our technocentric culture regards as basic, metal, plows, wheels, etc., was ingeniously circumvented, or where, conversely, their presence was inconsequential. For example, Mesopotamia invented the wheel about 4000 BC, but its close neighbor Egypt made no use of wheels for another 2000 years. The classic period Maya, a literate civilization rivaling classical Europe in mathematics and astronomy made so little use of metals that they were technically in the Stone Age. By contrast, sub-Saharan Africa mastered ironworking by 500 BC, as early as China did, yet never developed a full-blown civilization. The Incas of Peru, where metalworking had begun about 1500 BC, created one of the world's largest and most closely administered empires, yet may have done so without writing as we know it, though the evidence is growing that the, uh, their kipu system was indeed a form of script. Japan made pottery long before anyone else, more than 12,000 years ago, but rice farming and full civilization did not appear there for another 10,000 years, adopted wholesale from China and Korea. The Japanese didn't begin to work bronze until 500 BC, but became famous for steel swords by the 16th century. At that time, they acquired European firearms, then abandoned them for 300 years. We should therefore be wary of technological determinism, for it tends to underestimate cultural factors and reduce complex questions of human adaptation to a, a simplistic, we're the winners of history, so why didn't others do what we did? We call agriculture and civilization inventions or experiments because that is how they look to hindsight. But they began accidentally, a series of seductive steps down a path leading, for most people, to lives of monotony and toil. Farming achieved quantity at the expense of quality. More food and more people, but seldom better nourishment or better lives. People gave up a broad array of wild foods for a handful of starchy roots and grasses. As we domesticated these plants, the plants domesticated us. Without us, they die, and without them, so do we. There is no escape from agriculture except into mass starvation, and it has often led there anyway with drought and blight. Most people throughout most of time have lived on the edge of hunger, and much of the world 
still does. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Meyer Horowitz Theatre at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, you're listening to The Great Experiment, the second of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. In hunter-gatherer societies, barring a few special cases, the social structure was more or less egalitarian, with only slight differences in wealth and power between the greatest and the least. Leadership was either diffuse, a matter of consensus, or something earned by merit and example. The successful hunter did not sit down beside his kill and stuff himself on the spot. He shared the meat and thereby gained prestige. If a leader became overbearing or a minority disliked a majority decision, people could leave. In an uncrowded world without fixed borders or belongings, it was easy to vote with one's feet. The early towns and villages that sprang up in a dozen farming heartlands around the world after the last Ice Age seem to have continued these free and easy ways for a while. Most of them were small peasant communities in which everyone worked at similar tasks and had a comparable standard of living. Land was either communally owned or thought of as having no owner but the gods. Farmers, whose effort and skill made them wealthier, had an obligation to share with the needy to whom they were bound by kinship. Gradually, however, differences in wealth and power became entrenched. Freedom and social opportunity declined as populations rose and boundaries hardened between groups. This pattern first appears in the Neolithic villages of the Middle East, and it has recurred all over the world. The first farmers along the Danube, for example, left only tools in their remains. But their later settlements are heavily fortified and strewn with weapons. Here, said the great Australian archaeologist Gordon Child, we almost see the state of war of all, against all, arising as land became scarce. Writing those words in 1942, during Hitler's expansionist policy of Lebensraum, Child did not need to underline how little the world had changed from Stone Age times to his. Patriotism may indeed be, as Dr. Johnson said, the last refuge of a scoundrel, but it's also the tyrant's first resort. People afraid of outsiders are easily manipulated. The warrior caste, supposedly society's protectors, often become protection racketeers. In times of war or crisis, power is easily stolen from the many by the few on a promise of security. The more elusive or imaginary the foe, the better for manufacturing consent. The Inquisition did a roaring trade against the devil and the 20th century struggle between capitalism and communism had all the hallmarks of the old religious wars. Was defending either system really worth the risk of blowing up the world? Now we are losing hard-won freedoms on the pretext of a worldwide war on terror, as if terrorism were something new. Those who think it is should read The Secret Agent, a novel in which anarchist suicide bombers prowl London wearing explosives. It was written by Joseph Conrad a hundred years ago. The Muslim fanatic is proving a worthy replacement for the heretic, the anarchist, and especially the red menace so helpful to military budgets throughout the Cold War. The Neolithic Revolution seems to have been inevitable, or nearly so, wherever the makings for it were found. If the discovery of farming had been sparked by a freak combination of circumstances, we would expect to see it happen only in one particular place and spread outward from there, or to see it happen very rarely and at widely differing times. Until the Upper Paleolithic, or shortly before, nature had kept all the meddlesome apes in one big laboratory, the old world. But once the apes got out and made their way to the new world, there were two laboratories, each stocked with different raw materials 
and largely cut off from the other when sea levels rose with the melting of the ice. Given that the plants, animals, environments, and technologies in each lab were so different, the astonishing thing is what similar paths were taken on each side of the earth and how alike the results turned out to be. When the Spaniards reached the American mainland in the early 16th century, the peoples of the western and eastern hemispheres had not met since their ancestors parted as Ice Age hunters running out of game. It is true that there had been a few pre-Columbian contacts with Polynesians, Vikings, and possibly Asians, but these were too fleeting and too late to affect native flora and fauna or the rise of civilization. Not even such able seamen as the Norway rat and the cockroach had reached America before Columbus. Neither had the old world's terrible plagues, such as smallpox. So what took place in the early 1500s was truly exceptional, something that had never happened before and never will again. Two cultural experiments running in isolation for 15,000 years or more at last came face to face. Amazingly, after all that time, each could recognize the other's institutions. When Cortes landed in Mexico, he found roads, canals, cities, palaces, schools, law courts, markets, irrigation works, kings, priests, temples, peasants, artisans, armies, astronomers, merchants, sports, theater, art, music, and books. High civilization, differing in detail, but alike in essentials, had evolved independently on both sides of the earth. The test case of America suggests that we are predictable creatures, driven everywhere by similar needs, lusts, hopes, and follies. Smaller experiments running independently elsewhere had not reached the same level of complexity, but many showed the same trends. Even on remote Polynesian islands, settled by people descended from a boatload or two of intrepid seafarers, many civilizations sprang up, complete with social rank, intensive farming, and stone monuments. Faced not only with the similarity, but also the synchronicity of these discrete developments, we have to ask, why were no crops domesticated anywhere before the end of the last ice age? The people of 20,000 years ago were just as smart as those of 10,000 years ago. Not all of them were glutted with game, and the ice did not hold sway in lower latitudes. One possible answer to this question is a worry to us now. By studying ancient ice cores, which like tree rings leave a yearly record, climatologists have been able to track the average global temperature back over a quarter million years or more. These studies show that the world's climate has been unusually stable for the past 10,000 years, exactly the lifetime of agriculture and civilization. It seems we couldn't have invented farming earlier, even if we'd tried. The studies also show that the Earth's climate has sometimes fluctuated wildly, breaking from an ice age or plunging into one not over, not over centuries but in decades. The natural triggers of such events are not well understood. Some sort of chain reaction may provoke the rapid upsets, perhaps a sudden reversal of ocean currents or a release of methane from thawing permafrost. In his book on the glacial core studies, Richard Alley points out what should be obvious. Humans have built a civilization adapted to the climate we have, Increasingly, humanity is using everything this climate provides, and the climate of the last few thousand years is about as good as it gets. Change is not in our interest. Our only rational policy is not to risk provoking it. Yet we face abundant evidence that civilization itself, through fossil fuel emissions and other disturbances, is upsetting the long calm in which it grew. Ice sheets at both poles are breaking up. Glaciers in the Andes and Himalayas are thawing. Some have disappeared in only 25 years. 
Droughts and unusually hot weather have already caused world grain output to fall or stagnate for eight years in a row. During the same eight years, the number of mouths to feed went up by 600 million. Steady warming will be bad enough, but the worst outcome would be a sudden overturning of Earth's climatic balance, back to its old regime of sweats and chills. If that happens, crops will fail everywhere, and the great experiment of civilization will come to a catastrophic end. In the matter of food, we have grown as specialized and therefore as vulnerable as a saber-toothed cat. Thank you very much. Ideas tonight from the Meyer Horowitz Theater at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. You've been listening to The Great Experiment, the second of the 2004 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright, and the lecture series is called A Short History of Progress. Tomorrow night's lecture, Fool's Paradise, will come from the Place Riel Theater at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. The 2004 Massey Lectures are published as a book by the House of Anansi Press, and Ronald Wright is taking part in an online forum to discuss the lectures at www.anansi.ca. You can purchase the Massey Lectures either as a book or a CD by calling Ideas Transcripts and using your credit card. The number to call is 416-205-7367. Taxes and shipping are included, and the book costs $23.95. The five CDs sell in stores for $49.95, but you can buy it through Ideas Transcripts for the special price of $44.95, which also includes taxes and shipping. Again, the number to call is 416 205 7367. Tonight's lecture was recorded by Dave Riddell with technician Eric Wagers. Our partners in the Massey Lectures are the House of Anansi Press and Massey College in the University of Toronto. The Massey Lectures were produced for Ideas by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht and I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned now to CBC Radio 1 for the hourly news. Good evening and welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy and tonight we're in Saskatoon on this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. We're in the Place Riel Theatre on the campus of the University of Saskatchewan, and like everywhere else on this tour, the room is completely packed with people. Here tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the third of this year's Massey Lectures, collectively called A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country. What it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. This year, the Massey lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance, and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cut Stones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight from the Place Riel Theatre, 
at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Fool's Paradise, the third of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. It's a great honor for me, a very daunting honor, I might add, to be here tonight to uh, give the Massey Lecture. Uh, and a great pleasure to be in Saskatoon. I, uh, when I first came to Canada from England, uh, well, my father was from BC, but I grew up in England. When I first came to Canada, I was to go to grad school in the province next door uh, in Calgary, and I often came down this way. I, I've always thought of Saskatoon as actually one of the most delightful cities in the country. It's also... Um, a great pleasure to be in the province of Tommy Douglas, the cradle of health care, and so many other important ideas that have helped shape this country and make it one of the finest nations in which to live. <clears throat> From there to the third lecture entitled Fool's Paradise. The greatest wonder of the ancient world is how recent it all is. No city or monument is much more than 5,000 years old. Only about 70 lifetimes of 70 years have been lived end to end since civilization began. Civilization's entire run therefore occupies a mere 0.002% of the two and a half million years since our first ancestor sharpened a stone. In the last lecture, I outlined the rise and fall of man the hunter in the old stone age, and how his very progress, his perfection of weapons and techniques, led directly to the end of hunting as a way of life, except in places such as the North American prairies, where conditions favored the prey. Next came the discovery of farming, likely by women, during the New Stone Age or Neolithic in several parts of the world. And from that grew our experiment of civilization, which began as many independent enterprises, but in the last few centuries has coalesced, mainly by hostile takeover, into one big system that covers the earth. There are signs that this experiment, like hunting, is now in danger of falling victim to its own success. In the previous talks, I mentioned nuclear weapons and greenhouse gases. The big bang in the atom is obviously far deadlier than the small bangs in millions of engines. But if we are unlucky or unwise, both could end civilization on its present scale. Much simpler technologies have proved fatal in the past. Sometimes the trouble lies in a particular invention or idea, but it also lies in social structure, in the way people tend to behave when squeezed together in urban civilizations, where power and wealth rise upwards and the many are ruled by the few. In this talk, I want to speak about two traps sprung by progress, one on a small Pacific island, the other on the plains of Iraq. The wrecks of our failed experiments lie in deserts and jungles like fallen airliners whose flight recorders can tell us what went wrong. So archaeology is perhaps the best tool we have for looking ahead because it provides a deep reading of the direction and momentum of our course through time, what we are, where we have come from, and therefore where we are most likely to be going. Unlike written history, which is often highly edited, archaeology can uncover the deeds we have forgotten or have chosen to forget. A realistic understanding of the past is quite a new thing, a late fruit of the Enlightenment, although people of many times have felt the tug of what the Elizabethan antiquarian William Camden called the back-looking curiosity. Antiquity, he wrote, 
hath a certain resemblance with eternity. It is a sweet food of the mind. Not everyone's mind was so open in his day. A Spanish viceroy of Peru, who had just seen the Inca capital high in the Andes with its walls of giant stones fitted like gems, wrote back to his king, I have examined the fortress that the Incas built, which shows clearly the work of the devil, for it does not seem possible that the strength and skill of men could have made it. Even today, some opt for the comforts of mystification, preferring to believe that the wonders of the ancient world were built by Atlanteans, gods, or space travelers, instead of by thousands toiling in the sun. Such thinking robs our forerunners of their due, but us of their experience, because then one can believe whatever one likes about the past without having to confront the bones, potsherds, and inscriptions which tell us that people all over the world, time and again, have made similar advances and mistakes. About two centuries after the Spanish invasion of Peru, a Dutch fleet in the South Seas, far to the west of Chile and below the Tropic of Capricorn, came upon a site hardly less awesome and even more inexplicable than the megalithic buildings of the Andes. On Easter Day, 1722, the Dutchmen sighted an unknown island so treeless and eroded they mistook its barren hills for dunes. They were amazed as they drew near to see hundreds of standing stone images as tall as an Amsterdam house. We could not comprehend how it was possible that these people who are devoid of heavy thick timber or strong ropes nevertheless had been able to erect such images which were fully 30 feet high. Captain Cook later confirmed the island's desolation, finding no wood for fuel, nor any fresh water worth taking on board. He described the island as tiny canoes, made from scraps of driftwood stitched together like shoe leather, as the worst in the Pacific. Nature, Cook concluded, had been exceedingly sparing of her favors to this spot. The great mystery of Easter Island that struck all early visitors was not just that these colossal statues stood in such a tiny and remote corner of the world, but that the stones seemed to have been put there without tackle, as if set down from the sky. The Spaniards who had credited the devil with the splendors of Inca architecture were merely unable to recognize another culture's achievements. But even scientific observers could not, at first, account for the megaliths of Easter Island. The figures stood there mockingly, defying common sense. We now know the answer to the riddle, and it's a chilling one. With all due respect to Captain Cook, nature had not been unusually stingy with her favors. Pollen studies of the island's crater lakes have shown that it was once well-watered and green, with rich volcanic earth supporting thick woods of the Chilean wine palm, a fine timber that can grow as big as an oak. No natural disaster had changed that, no eruption, no drought or disease. The catastrophe on Easter Island was man. <laughs> Rapa Nui, as Polynesians call the place, was settled during the fifth century AD by migrants from the Marquesas or the Gambiers arriving in big catamarans stocked with their usual range of crops and animals. Dogs, chickens, edible rats, sugar cane, bananas, sweet potatoes, and mulberry for making bark cloth. Easter Island proved too cold for breadfruit and coconut palms, but was rich in seafood. Fish, seals, porpoises, turtles, and nesting seabirds. Within five or six centuries, the settlers multiplied to about 10,000 people, a lot for 64 square miles. They built villages with good houses on stone footings and cleared all the best land for fields. Socially, they split into clans and ranks, nobles, priests, commoners, and there may have been a paramount chief or king. Like Polynesians on some other islands, each clan began to honor its ancestry with impressive stone images. 
These were hewn from the yielding volcanic tuff of a crater and set up on platforms by the shore. As time went on, the statue cult became increasingly rivalrous and extravagant, reaching its apogee during Europe's high Middle Ages while the Plantagenet kings ruled England. Each generation of images grew bigger than the last, demanding more timber, rope, and manpower for hauling to the ahu, or altars. Trees were cut faster than they could grow, a problem worsened by the settlers' rats who ate the seeds and saplings. By A.D. 1400, no more tree pollen is found in the annual layers of the crater lakes. The woods had been utterly destroyed by both the largest and the smallest mammal on the island. We might think that in such a limited place where, from the height of Terevaca, islanders could survey their whole world at a glance, steps would have been taken to halt the cutting, to protect the saplings, to replant. We might think that as trees became scarce, the erection of statues would have been curtailed and timber reserved for essential purposes, such as boat building and roofing. But that is not what happened. The people who felled the last tree could see it was the last, could know with complete certainty that there would never be another. And they felled it anyway. All shade vanished from the land, except the hard-edged shadows cast by the petrified ancestors, whom the people loved all the more because they made them feel less alone. For a generation or so, there was enough old lumber to haul the great stones and still keep a few canoes seaworthy for deep water. But the day came when the last good boat was gone. The people then knew there would be little seafood and, worse, no way of escape. The word for wood, rakau, became the dearest in their language. Wars broke out over ancient planks and worm-eaten bits of jetsam. They ate all their dogs and nearly all the nesting birds. And the unbearable stillness of the place deepened with animal silences. There was nothing left now but the moai, the stone giants who had devoured the land. And still, these promised the return of plenty if only the people would keep faith and honor them with increase. But how will we take you to the altars? asked the carvers. And the Moai answered that when the time came, they would walk there on their own. So the sound of hammering still rang from the quarries, and the crater walls came alive with hundreds of new giants, growing even bigger now that they had no need of human transport. The tallest ever set on an altar is over 30 feet high and weighs 80 tons. The tallest ever carved is 65 feet long and more than 200 tons, comparable to the greatest stones worked by the Incas or Egyptians. Except, of course, that it never budged an inch. By the end, there were more than a thousand Moai, one for every ten islanders in their heyday. But the good days were gone, gone with the good earth, which had been carried away on the endless wind and washed by flash floods into the sea. The people had been seduced by a kind of progress that becomes a mania, an ideological pathology, as some anthropologists call it. When Europeans arrived in the 18th century, the worst was over. They found only one or two living souls per statue, a sorry remnant, in Cook's words, small, lean, timid and miserable. The Europeans heard tales of how the warrior class had taken power, how the island had convulsed with burning villages, gory battles, and cannibal feasts. Daggers and spearheads became the commonest tools on the island, hoarded in pits like the grenades and assault rifles kept by modern-day survivalists. Even this was not quite the nadir. Between the Dutch visit of 1722 and Cook's 50 years later, the people again made war on each other and, for the first time, on the ancestors as well. Cook found Moai toppled from their platforms, cracked and beheaded 
the ruins littered with human bone. We do not know exactly what promises had been made by the demanding Muay to the people, but it seems likely that the arrival of an outside world in floating castles of unimaginable wealth and menace might have exposed certain illusions of the statue cult, replacing compulsive belief with equally compulsive disenchantment. Whatever its animus, the destruction on Rapa Nui raged for at least 70 years. Each foreign ship saw fewer upright statues until not one giant was left standing on its altar. The work of demolition must have been extremely arduous for the few descendants of the builders. Its thoroughness and deliberation speak of something deeper than clan warfare, of a people angry at their reckless fathers, of a revolt against the dead. The lesson that Rapa Nui holds for our world has not gone unremarked. In the epilogue to their 1992 book, Easter Island, Earth Island, the archaeologists Paul Barn and John Flenley are explicit. The islanders, they write, carried out for us the experiment of permitting unrestricted population growth, profligate use of resources, destruction of the environment, and boundless confidence in their religion to take care of the future. The result was an ecological disaster leading to a population crash. Do we have to repeat the experiment on a grand scale? Is the human personality always the same as that of the person who felled the last tree? The last tree, the last mammoth, the last dodo, and soon perhaps the last fish and the last gorilla. On the basis of what police call form, we are serial killers beyond reason. But has this always been and must it always be the case? Are all human systems doomed to stagger along under the mounting weight of their internal logic until it crushes them? As I've proposed, the answers and, I think, the remedies lie in the fates of past societies. Easter Island's isolation makes it uniquely important as a microcosm of more complex systems, including this big island on which we drift through space. Easter Island punched way above its weight, but it boxed alone as if in a looking glass, and we have been able to replay the moves by which it knocked itself out. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Place Riel Theatre at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, you're listening to Fool's Paradise, the third of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. Some writers, seeing history in terms of weapons and winners, have overemphasized the different rates at which cultures and continents developed. What strikes me as more surprising and highly significant for finding out what kind of creature we humans are is how little time it took people to do very similar things independently all around the world, even though they were working within different cultures and ecologies. By 3,000 years ago, civilization had arisen in at least seven places. Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Mediterranean, India, China, Mexico, and Peru. Archaeology shows that only about half of these had received their crops and cultural stimuli from others. The rest had built themselves up from scratch without suspecting that anyone else in the world was doing the same. This compelling parallelism of ideas, processes, and forms tells us something important, that given certain broad conditions, human societies everywhere will move towards greater size, complexity, and environmental demand. Easter Island's little civilization was one of the last to develop independently. The earliest of all was Sumer in what is now southern Iraq. The Sumerians, whose own ethnic and linguistic stock is unclear, 
set a pattern that Semitic cultures and others in the old world would follow. They came to exemplify both the best and worst of the civilized life, and they told us about themselves in cuneiform script on clay tablets, one of the most enduring mediums for the human voice, a writing like the tracks of trained birds. They set down the oldest written stories in the world, a body of texts known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, compiled in strong-walled Uruk, the city of great streets, around the time that Stonehenge and the first Egyptian pyramids were being built. Legends we know from the Hebrew Bible, the Garden of Eden, the Flood, appear in Gilgamesh in earlier forms, along with other tales deemed too racy, perhaps, for inclusion in the Pentateuch. <laughs> One of these, the story of the wild man Enkidu, who is seduced into the city by a harlot, a child of pleasure, recalls our transition from the hunting to the urban life. And now the wild creatures had all fled away. Enkidu was grown weak, for wisdom was in him, and the thoughts of a man were in his heart. So he returned and sat down at the woman's feet and listened intently to what she said. You are wise, Enkidu, and now you have become like a god. Why do you want to run wild with the beasts in the hills? Come with me. I will take you to strong-walled Uruk, to the blessed temple of Ishtar and of Anu, of love and heaven. There lives King Gilgamesh, who is very strong and who lords it over men. In the last lecture, we left the Middle East soon after farming began in the lands often called the Fertile Crescent, which stretched from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf and reached up into Anatolia. Throughout human time, this has been the crossroads of Africa, Europe, and Asia. Back in the Old Stone Age, Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons had contested this turf for 50,000 years, moving north and south with fluctuations in the climate, living at different times in the same rock shelters, possibly evicting one another. I suspect that if we could tune into the Middle Eastern news at almost any period in prehistory, we would find the place seething with creativity and strife, as it has since history began. But it's a mistake to assume that the Fertile Crescent, for all its natural endowments, its plants and animals suitable for domestication, develop quickly or easily. Even after several thousand years of farming and herding, the biggest Middle Eastern settlements, Jericho near the Dead Sea and Chachal Huyuk in Anatolia, were still tiny, covering only 10 acres and 32 acres respectively. Insofar as the Garden of Eden had a physical geography, this was it. The serpent, however, was not the only enemy. Fortifications at Jericho and elsewhere speak of competition for land and a heavier human presence than the villages alone attest. Nor was the farming life easier or healthier than the hunting life had been. People were smaller in build and worked longer hours than non-farmers. Average life expectancy, deduced from burials at Chatal Huyuk, was 29 years for women and 34 for men. By 6000 BC, there is evidence of widespread deforestation and erosion. Cavalier fire setting and overgrazing by goats may have been chief culprits, but lime burning for plaster and whitewash also destroyed the woodland until it became the thorny scrub and semi-desert seen there today. By 5500 BC, many of the early Neolithic sites were abandoned. As on Easter Island, people had befouled their nest, or rather had stripped it bare. But unlike the Easter Islanders, these people had room to flee and start again. Self-driven from Eden, they found a second paradise lower down on the great floodplain of the Tigris and Euphrates, the land called Mesopotamia or Iraq. The look of this place is fresh in our minds from modern wars. Treeless plains and dying oases, salt pans, dust storms, oil slicks and burnt-out tanks. 
Here and there, crumbling in the roofless sun and wind, are great mounds of mud brick, ruins of ancient cities whose names still echo in the cellars of our culture. Babylon, Uruk, and Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was born. Back in the 5th and 4th millennia BC, southern Iraq had been a marshy delta of channels teeming with fish, reeds taller than a house, and sandbars rich in date palms. Wild boar and waterfowl lived in the cane breaks. The alluvial earth, if tilled, could yield a hundredfold on every seed, for this was new land laid down at the head of the Persian Gulf. New, in a manner of speaking. The people who settled here had, in effect, followed their old fields, which had been washed from the worn hills by the great rivers flowing, as the Bible says, out of Eden. So God had spread a second chance before the children of Adam and Eve, but in this recycled Eden, unlike the first, they would eat only by sweat and toil. The great Australian uh, archaeologist Gordon Child wrote in his classic work, The Most Ancient East, the exploitation of this natural paradise required intensive labor and the organized cooperation of large bodies of men. Arable land had literally to be created by a separation of land from water. The swamps must be drained, the floods controlled, the life-giving waters led to the rainless desert by artificial canals. So it seems that in this case at least, the hierarchies of civilization grew with the demands of water control. The scattered mud villages grew into towns, and by 3000 BC, these towns had become small cities, rebuilt again and again on their own debris, until they rose above the plain in earthen mounds known as tells. Throughout most of its thousand-year run, Sumerian civilization was dominated by a dozen such cities each the heart of a small state. Only twice was a unified kingdom briefly forged, first by the Semitic invader Sargon and later by the third dynasty of Ur. It is thought that four-fifths of the Sumerian population lived in urban centers and that the entire population was only half a million. Contemporary Egypt's population, by comparison, was more rural and about three times that size. In the early days, Sumerian land was owned communally, and people brought their crops, or at least their surplus, to the city shrine, where a priesthood looked after human and divine affairs, watching the stars, directing irrigation works, improving the crops, brewing and winemaking, and building ever grander temples. As time went by, the cities grew layer by layer into man-made hills, crowned with the typical Mesopotamian steppe pyramid or ziggurat, a sacred mountain commanding the human realm. Such were the buildings the Israelites later lampooned as the Tower of Babel. The priesthoods, which had started as village cooperatives, also grew vertically to become the first corporations, complete with officials and employees, undertaking the not unprofitable task of administering the gods' estates. The plains of southern Iraq were rich farmland, but lacked most other things town life required. Timber, flint, obsidian, metals, and every block of stone for building, carving, and food grinding had to be imported in return for grain and cloth. So wheeled carts, yoked oxen, and the use of copper and bronze developed early. Trade and property became highly important and have been close to the heart of Western culture ever since. Middle Easterners took a mercenary view of their gods as big landowners and themselves as serfs, toiling in the Lord's vineyard. Unlike the writing of Egypt, China, or Mesoamerica, Sumer's writing was invented not for sacred texts, divination, literature, or even kingly propaganda, but for accounting. <laughs> Over time, the priestly corporations grew bloated and exploitive concerned more with their own good than that of their lowlier members. Though they developed elements of capitalism, such as private ownership, there was no free competition of the kind Adam Smith recommended. The Sumerian corporations were monopolies, legitimized by heaven, somewhat like medieval monasteries or the fiefdoms of televangelists. 
Their way of life, however, was far from monastic, as the temple harlotry in Gilgamesh implies. The Sumerian priests may have been sincere believers in their gods, although ancient people were not exempt from manipulations of credulity. At their worst, they were the world's first racketeers, running the eternal money spinners, protection, booze, and girls. <laughs> the protection initially offered by the priesthood was from the forces of nature and the wrath of the gods. But as the Sumerian city-states grew, they began to make war amongst themselves. Their wealth also drew raids from mountain and desert folk who, though less civilized, were often better armed. So it was that Uruk, at 1,100 acres and 50,000 people, by far the biggest Sumerian city, became strong-walled, the wonder of its world. Having invented irrigation, the city, the corporation, and writing, Sumer added professional soldiers and hereditary kings. The kings moved out of the temples and into palaces of their own, where they forged personal links with divinity, claiming godly status by virtue of descent from heaven, a notion that would appear in many cultures and endure into modern times as divine right. With kingship came new uses for writing, dynastic history and propaganda, the exaltation of a single individual. As Bertolt Brecht dryly reflects in his poem about a worker looking at the pyramids, the books are filled with names of kings. Was it kings who hold the craggy blocks of stone? Young Alexander conquered India. He alone? By 2500 BC, the days of collective land holding by city and corporation were gone. The fields now belonged to lords and great families. The Sumerian populace became serfs and sharecroppers, and beneath them was a permanent underclass of slaves, a feature of Western civilization that would last until the 19th century after Christ. States arrogate to themselves the power of coercive violence, the right to crack the whip, execute prisoners, send young men to the battlefield. From this stems that venomous bloom which J.M. Kutze has called in his extraordinary novel, Waiting for the Barbarians, the black flower of civilization. Torture, wrongful imprisonment, violence for display, the forging of might into right. Among the privileges of god kings in Sumer and elsewhere were various styles of human sacrifice, including the right to take people along for company beyond the grave. The king's tomb at Ur, known to archaeologists as the Death Pit, contains the first mass burial of royal concubines, retainers, and the workers who built it. About 75 men and women all told, their skeletons nested like spoons in a drawer. Around the world, from Egypt and Greece to China and Mexico, the idea that the king's life was worth so much more than other people's would take root again and again. The builders who seal the tomb are killed on the spot by guards, who are themselves killed by other guards, and so on, until the late king's executors deem his resting place sufficiently honored and secure. Throughout the ancient world, rulers performed the ultimate political theater, public sacrifice of captives. As a 19th century Ashanti king in what is now Ghana candidly told the British, if I were to abolish human sacrifice, I should deprive myself of one of the most effectual means of keeping the people in subjection. The British, who at that time were tying Indian mutineers across the mouths of cannon and blowing them in half, scarcely needed such advice. <laughs> Each culture has its codes and sensibilities. In Mexico, the Spanish conquistadors were appalled by the ritual slaughter of prisoners done with a blade to the heart. But the Aztecs were equally horrified when they saw the Spaniards burn people alive. Violence is as old as man, but civilizations commit it with a deliberation that lends it special horror. In the death pit of Ur, we can foreglimpse all the mass graves to come, down through 5,000 years to Bosnia and Rwanda 
and full circle to the Iraq of Saddam Hussein, who, like the ancient kings of that land, had his name stamped on the bricks used to rebuild their monuments. In civilization, unlike the hunter-gatherer life, it has always mattered who you are. We have come a very long way from extended families round a Stone Age campfire to societies in which some people are demigods and others nothing more than flesh to be worked to death or buried in their betters' tombs. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Place Riel Theatre at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, you're listening to Fool's Paradise, the third of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. Until mechanized farming began, food growers, whether peasants or slaves, outnumbered the elite and professionals who lived off their surplus by about 10 to 1. The Massey's reward for this was usually little more than bare survival, alleviated by the consolations of custom and belief. If they were lucky, they might belong to a state which, in enlightened self-interest, would give public assistance in times of crop failure. The ideal of the leader as provider and the wealthy as open-handed survived to some extent and can be traced in many languages. Our word, Lord, comes from the Old English hlaford, or loaf ward, he who guarded the bread supply and was expected to share it out. One of an Inca emperor's many titles was wakchakuyach, he who cares for the bereft. The chiefs of Hawaii were warned by their elders against hoarding food or goods for themselves. The hands of the ari'i must always be open. On this rests your prestige. And it was said of the Chinese emperors that their first duty was to feed their people. The truth is that China, like most agrarian societies, lurched from famine to famine well into modern times. Effective food security was as rare in the past as it is today in the Third World. Most ancient states did not have the storage or transport to deal with anything worse than a minor crisis. The Incas and Romans were probably the best at famine relief, and it's no coincidence that both were very large empires spread over several climatic zones with good warehousing, roads, and sea lanes. A small civilization such as Sumer, dependent on a single ecosystem and without high ground, was especially vulnerable to flood and drought. Such disasters were viewed then as now as acts of God or gods. Like us, the Sumerians were only dimly aware that human activity was also to blame. Floodplains will always flood, sooner or later, but deforestation of the great watersheds upstream made inundations much fiercer and more deadly than they would otherwise have been. Woodlands, with their carpet of undergrowth, mosses, and loam, work like great sponges, soaking up rainfall and allowing it to filter slowly into the earth below. Trees drink up water and breathe it into the air. But wherever primeval woods and their soils have been destroyed by cutting, burning, overgrazing, or plowing, the bare subsoil bakes hard in dry weather and acts like a roof in wet. The result is flash floods, sometimes carrying such heavy loads of silt and gravel that they rush from steep ravines like liquid concrete. Staggering alluvial forces are at work in Mesopotamia. In the 5,000 years since Sumerian records began, the twin rivers have filled in 80 miles of the Persian Gulf. Iraq's second city of Basra was open sea in ancient times. The plains of Sumer are more than 200 miles wide. In times of an unusually great flood, the kind that might happen once a century or so, a king standing in the rain on a temple softening under his feet would see nothing but water between himself and the rim of the sky. Not only did Adam and Eve drive themselves from Eden, but the eroded landscape they left behind set the stage for Noah's flood. In the early days, when the city mounds were low and easily swamped, the only refuge would have been a boat. The Sumerian version of the legend, told in the first person by a man named 
Utnapishtim, has the ring of real events, with vivid detail on freak weather and broken dams. In it, we may see not only the forerunner of the biblical story, but the first eyewitness account of a man-made environmental catastrophe. In those days, the world teemed, the people multiplied. Enlil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. Enlil, the storm god, is the instigator. Others, including Ishtar, goddess of love and queen of heaven, a less virginal forerunner of Mary, go along with it. But Ea, the god of wisdom, warns Utnapishtim in a dream. Tear down your house, I say, and build a boat. Abandon possessions and look for life. Take up into the boat the seed of all living creatures. The time was fulfilled. The evening came. The rider of the storm sent down the rain. I looked out at the weather, and it was terrible. So I, too, boarded the boat and battened her down. With the first light of dawn, a black cloud came from the horizon. It thundered within, where Adad, lord of the storm, was riding. Then the gods of the abyss rose up. Nergal pulled out the dams of the nether waters. Ninurta, the warlord, threw down the dikes. And the god of the storm turned daylight to darkness when he smashed the land like a cup. For six days and nights the winds blew. Torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world. When the seventh day dawned, I looked at the face of the world, and there was silence. All mankind was turned to clay. The surface of the sea stretched as flat as a rooftop. I opened a hatch, and the light fell on my face. Then I bowed down low. I sat down and I wept, for on every side was the waste of water. Utnapishtim sends out birds to find land. When the waters start to go down, he burns incense to draw down the gods, but his wording hints that the real attraction is the stench of corpses in the mud. The gods, he says, gathered like flies over the sacrifice. Unlike Jehovah with his rainbow, the Sumerian deities make no promises. Ishtar fingers her necklace and says only that she will remember. Enlil sees the ark and gets angry. Has any of these mortals escaped? Not one was to have survived. Then Ea, who had given the warning and saved the animals, upbraids Enlil for what he has done and begins a doleful chant. Would that a lion had ravaged mankind rather than the flood. Would that famine had wasted the world rather than the flood. Ea should have been more careful what he wished for. When Sir Leonard Woolley excavated in Sumer between the world wars, he wrote, To those who have seen the Mesopotamian desert, the ancient world seems well nigh incredible. So complete is the contrast between past and present. Why, if Ur was an empire's capital, if Sumer was once a vast granary, has the population dwindled to nothing, the very soil lost its virtue? Woolley's question has a one-word answer, salt. Rivers rinse salt from rocks and earth and carry it to the sea, but when people divert water onto arid land, much of it evaporates and the salt stays behind. Irrigation also causes waterlogging, allowing brackish groundwater to seep upwards. Unless there is good drainage, long fallowing, and enough rainfall to flush the land, irrigation schemes are future salt pans. Southern Iraq was one of the most inviting areas to begin irrigation, and one of the hardest in which to sustain it. One of the most seductive traps ever laid by progress. After a few centuries of bumper yields, the land began to turn against its tillers. The first sign of trouble was a decline in wheat, a crop that behaves like the coal miner's canary. As time went by, 
the Sumerians had to replace wheat with barley, which has a higher tolerance for salt. By 2500 BC, wheat was only 15% of the crop, and by 2100 BC, Ur had given up wheat altogether. As builders of the world's first great watering schemes, the Sumerians can hardly be blamed for failing to foresee their new technology's consequences. But political and cultural pressures certainly made matters worse. When populations were smaller, the cities had been able to sidestep the problem by lengthening fallow periods, abandoning ruined fields, and bringing new land under production, albeit with rising effort and cost. But after the mid-third millennium, there was no new land to be had. Population was then at a peak, the ruling class top-heavy, and chronic warfare required the support of standing armies, nearly always a sign and a cause of trouble. Like the Easter Islanders, the Sumerians failed to reform their society to reduce its environmental impact. On the contrary, they tried to intensify production, especially during the Akkadian Empire, and their swan song under the third dynasty of Ur, which fell in 2000 BC. The short-lived empire of Ur exhibits the same behavior as on Easter Island, sticking to entrenched beliefs and practices, robbing the future to pay the present, spending the last reserves of natural capital on a reckless binge of excessive wealth and glory. Canals were lengthened, fallow periods reduced, population increased, and the economic surplus concentrated on Ur itself to support grandiose building projects. The result was a few generations of prosperity, for the rulers, followed by a collapse from which southern Mesopotamia has never recovered. By 2000 BC, scribes were reporting that the earth had turned white with salt. All crops, including barley, were failing. Yields fell to a third of their original levels. The Sumerians' thousand years in the sun of history came to an end. Political power shifted north to Babylon and Assyria, and much later, under Islam, to Baghdad. Northern Mesopotamia is better drained than the south, but even there, the same cycles of degradation would be repeated by empire after empire down to modern times. No one, it seems, was willing to learn from the past. Today, fully half of Iraq's irrigated land is saline, the highest proportion in the world, followed by the other two centers of floodplain civilization, Egypt and Pakistan. As for the ancient cities of Sumer, a few struggled on as villages, but most were utterly abandoned. Even after 4,000 years, the land around them remains sour and barren, still white with the dust of progress. Thank you very much. On ideas tonight from the Place Riel Theatre at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, you've been listening to Fool's Paradise, the third of the 2004 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright, and the lecture series is called A Short History of Progress. Tomorrow night's lecture, Pyramid Schemes, will come from the Alumni Theatre at King's College in Halifax. The 2004 Massey Lectures are published as a book by the House of Anansi Press, and Ronald Wright is taking part in an online forum to discuss the lectures at www.anansi.ca. You can purchase the Massey Lectures either as a book or a CD by calling Ideas Transcripts and using your credit card. The number to call is 416-205-7367. 
taxes and shipping are included, and the book costs $23.95. The five CDs sell in stores for $49.95, but you can buy it through Ideas Transcripts for the special price of $44.95, which also includes taxes and shipping. Again, the number to call is 416-205-7367. Tonight's lecture was recorded by Dave Riddell with technician Tim Colrus. Our partners in the Massey Lectures are the House of Anansi Press and Massey College in the University of Toronto. The Massey Lectures were produced for Ideas by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht, and I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned to CBC Radio 1 for the hourly news, followed by the Arts Tonight and Between the Covers. Good evening, and welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy. Tonight we're in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. We're in the Alumni Theatre on the campus of King's College, with a standing room only audience, here tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the fourth of this year's Massey Lectures, called A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country. What it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. This year, the Massey Lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cut Stones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight, from the Alumni Theatre at the University of King's College in Halifax, Pyramid Schemes the fourth of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, tonight, in the fourth hour, or rather than say what I'm going to say, I will just start reading it. The title of this lecture is Pyramid Schemes. In the forests of Yucatan and Belize dwells a lovely but sinister temptress, whom the Maya call the Shtabai. She's seen by lone hunters who have spent too long in the bush, and she drives them mad with lust. They glimpse her through the leaves and cannot help but follow, oblivious as the twilight thickens. They go on following, getting so close they can smell the Shtabai's wild scent and feel the delicious flick of her long hair. When they wake up, if they wake up, for many of them are never seen again, they do so cut and bleeding with their britches down, completely lost. Sex, food, wealth, power, prestige. They lure us onward, make us progress. And to these we can add progress itself in its modern meaning of material things getting better and better, an idea that arose with the Industrial Revolution and became its great article of faith. The two ancient societies whose careers I've outlined so far, Easter Island and Sumer, probably had no such notion of progress, yet they were seduced and ruined by their own desires all the same, following a promise of more and more that left them starving in a wasteland of their making. But how typical were they of civilizations as a whole? Is civilization inherently maladaptive, an experiment doomed by its own dynamics? Ruins all over the earth seem to say so. Yet the presence of modern civilization everywhere seems to contradict the past. Is ours the exception that has tamed the Shtabai and will live with her happily ever after? In this talk, I shall first outline the two most famous cases of internal collapse, the fall of Rome in the 4th century AD and of the classic Maya in the 9th, and then look briefly at two hardy perennials, Egypt and China. The Roman and Maya civilizations were much later, larger, and in the case of Rome at least, far more complex than the Sumerian. Like the Sumerians, the classic Maya lived in a constellation of rival city-states. But their peak population was about ten times greater than Sumer's, between five and seven or eight million all told. The Roman Empire at its height ruled some 50 million people, a quarter of the human race at that time. The Maya and Romans had no connection with each other. They arose at similar times but in separate social laboratories, the New World and the old. This makes them useful for recognizing human behaviors that transcend specifics of time, place, and culture. Easter Island and Sumer wrecked their environment so thoroughly and fell so hard that they became effectively extinct. But Rome and the Maya managed to linger in simplified medieval forms after their collapses leaving direct descendants who are part of today's world. Rome's heirs were the Byzantine Empire and the European nations who speak modern dialects of Latin. The Maya were not empire builders, and any renaissance they might have achieved was forestalled by the Spanish invasion in the 16th century. Yet the death of their culture has been exaggerated. Eight million people speak Mayan languages today, roughly the same number as in the classic period, and many of them practice distinctly Maya forms of social organization, belief, art, and calendrical astrology. In my dystopian novel, A Scientific Romance, a character calls civilization a pyramid scheme. And a few years later, I used the phrase for the title of an article that became the seed of these lectures. A pyramid of stone or brick, which may also take the shape of colossal statues, tombs, office towers, missile silos, is the outward and visible sign of a human social pyramid. And the human pyramid is in turn carried by a less visible natural pyramid, the food chain and all other resources 
in the surrounding ecology, often termed natural capital. The careers of Rome and the Maya also show, I think, that civilizations often behave like pyramid sales schemes, thriving only while they grow. They gather wealth to the center from an expanding periphery, which may be the frontier of a political and trading empire or a colonization of nature through intensified use of resources, often both. Such a civilization is therefore most unstable at its peak when it has reached the maximum demand on the ecology. Unless a new source of wealth or energy appears, it has no room left to raise production or absorb the shock of natural fluctuations. The only way onward is to keep wringing new loans from nature and humanity. Once nature starts to foreclose with erosion, crop failure, famine, disease, the social contract breaks down. People may suffer stoically for a while, but sooner or later the ruler's relationship with heaven is exposed as a delusion or a lie. Then the temples are looted, the statues thrown down, the barbarians welcomed, and the emperor's naked rump is last seen fleeing through a palace window. I should make a distinction between true collapses and political upheavals such as the French, Russian, and Mexican revolutions. A true collapse results in a society's extinction or near extinction, during which very large numbers of people die or scatter. Recovery, if there is one, takes centuries, for it requires the regeneration of natural capital as woods, water, and topsoil slowly rebuild. Picture the world during the heyday of Rome on the eve of the year 180 when Marcus Aurelius died and the long agony of decline began. In the two millennia that had gone by since the fall of Sumer, Civilizations had flowered all round the earth. On a typical second century day, the sun would rise on Han, China, pass over the Buddhist stupas of Maori and India, glare down on the brick ruins of the Indus and Euphrates valleys, and take more than two hours to traverse the Roman lake of the Mediterranean. By the time it was noon at Gibraltar, Worshippers would be greeting the dawn from the tops of pyramids in highland Mexico, the Guatemalan jungle, and the irrigated valleys of Peru. Only as the sun moved west across the Pacific would it shine on no cities or stone temples. But even there, the planting and building had already begun, from Fiji to the Marquesas, the first Polynesian stepping stones across the ocean hemisphere. In the second century AD, declared Edward Gibbon in his Decline and Fall, published in 1776. The empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. People of non-European descent might dispute those claims, but Gibbon was certainly right when he added that Rome's fall will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. All Europe's empires and Neo-Europe's, such as the United States, tried to mold themselves on imagined classical ideals, though the real Rome was hardly the imperium of order and clean marble suggested by its surviving architecture. Like every society, the Romans lurched from crisis to crisis, making the rules as they went along. And in truth, English-speaking democracy owes as much to the Anglo-Saxons as it does to any classical model. In the last talk, I mentioned that the first farming villages in the world appeared in the uplands of the Fertile Crescent, or Middle East, and that mankind drove itself from Eden in the sixth millennium BC by denuding the land. Thousands of years later, the sad story was replayed in the Mediterranean basin, especially in hilly terrain once thickly covered by old growth forests, an ecosystem of which hardly a trace survives today. Once again, the principal villains across Greece, southern Italy, southern France, and Spain were timber felling, burning, and goats. <laughs> Woodlands can withstand a certain level of burning and felling, but if too many grazing animals are present, 
the seedlings get eaten, and the standing trees die of old age. Wild grazers are thinned out by predators, including humans, but herders often keep so many animals that grazing pressure is relentless. In times of high population and rural poverty, grazing is often followed by the tilling of hillsides, hoes or plows delivering the final blow to whatever soil remains, a common sight in the so-called developing world today. Early in the 6th century BC, the Athenians became alarmed by deforestation. Greek city populations were growing quickly at that time. Most of the timber was already cut, and the poor were farming goat-stripped hills with disastrous results. Unlike the Sumerians, who may have been unaware of the destruction caused by their irrigation methods until it was too late, the Greeks understood what was happening and tried to do something. In 590 BC, the statesman Solon, realizing that rural poverty and land alienation by powerful Athenian nobles lay behind much of the trouble, outlawed debt serfdom and food exports. He also tried to ban farming on steep slopes. A generation later, Pisistratus offered grants for olive planting, which would have been an effective reclamation measure, especially if combined with terracing. But as with such efforts in our day, funding and political will were unequal to the task. Some 200 years later, in his unfinished dialogue, Critias, Plato wrote a vivid account of the damage, showing a sophisticated knowledge of the connection between water and woods. What now remains compared with what then existed is like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth having wasted away. Mountains which now have nothing but food for bees had trees not very long ago. The land was enriched by the yearly rains, which were not lost to it, as now, by flowing from the bare land into the sea. But the soil was deep, and therein received the water, and kept it in the loamy earth, feeding springs and streams running everywhere. Now, only abandoned shrines remain to show where the springs once flowed. It's no coincidence that Greek power and achievement began to wane about this time. Archaeology reveals a similar picture elsewhere around the Mediterranean. Southern Italy and Sicily were well wooded until about 300 BC, but the woods quickly shrank as Rome and other cities grew, making heavy demands for timber, charcoal, and meat. Livestock and landholding patterns were again to blame. In several watersheds, so much earth was swept away from hillsides to estuaries that it formed malarial marshes and silted up ports such as Ostia and Pistum. Rome did not collapse for many more centuries, so this early degradation obviously wasn't severe enough to bring the economy down, but it accounts for shrinking agricultural output, growing reliance on imported grain, and rural decline in the heart of Italy. Shortly before the time of Christ, the poet Ovid wrote, Long ago, earth had better things to offer, crops without cultivation, fruit on the bough, honey in the hollow oak. No one tore the ground with plowshares, or parceled out the land, or swept the sea with dipping oars. The shore was the world's end. Clever human nature, victim of your inventions, disastrously creative. Why cordon cities with towered walls? Why arm for war? Until the time of Julius Caesar, Rome's conquests were essentially private enterprises. Roman citizens who went to war came back with booty, slaves, and a flow of tribute exacted by local agents on commission whose techniques included extortion and loan sharking. Cicero claimed that Brutus lent money to a Cypriot town at an interest rate of 48%, evidently a common practice and an early precedent for third world debt. <laughs> Whether they were well-born patricians or overnight millionaires, Rome's soldiers of fortune wanted to enjoy and display their winnings at home. The result was a land boom everywhere within range of the capital. Peasants were dispossessed and driven onto unsuitable land, 
with environmental consequences like those that Solon had recognized in Athens. Family farms couldn't compete against big estates using slave labor. They went bankrupt or were forced to sell out, and their young men joined the legions. The ancient commons of the Roman peasantry were alienated with even less legality. As in Sumer, public land passed quickly into private hands, a situation the Gracchus brothers tried to remedy with land reform in the late 2nd century BC. But the reform failed, the commons were lost, and the state had to placate the lower orders by handing out free wheat, a solution that became increasingly expensive as the urban proletariat increased. By the time of Claudius, 200,000 Roman families were on the dole. One of the revealing ironies of Rome's history is that the city-state's native democracy withered as its empire grew. Real power passed from the Senate into the willing hands of field commanders such as Julius Caesar, who controlled whole armies and provinces. It must be said that in return for power, Caesar gave Rome intelligent reforms, a precedent often invoked by despots impatient with the law. Necessity, wrote Milton, is always the tyrant's plea. Some years after Julius Caesar's murder and a further round of civil wars, the Senate made a deal with Caesar's great-nephew Octavian, who took the name Augustus and the new office of Princeps. These measures were supposed to be a special case for his lifetime only. In theory, he was the chief magistrate, and the writ of the Republic still ran. In reality, a new age of quasi-monarchy had begun. The empire had outgrown the institutions of its founding city. Augustus and many of his successors proved able and enlightened rulers. Most of them understood, as he did, that the time for consolidation and integration of the empire had come. A hawkish dream of reconquering Alexander's domains was quietly dropped. The empire's eastern boundary was fixed at the Euphrates and along the Rhine and Danube. The other main borders were natural, the Sahara and Arabian deserts and the Atlantic shore. The Augustan order lasted with various upsets for nearly two centuries. The Western Empire would then take another two centuries to die. The capital city continued to grow long after its dominions had begun to fray at the edges. As in modern countries, unrest in the provinces drove people to the center. Rome may have reached its highest population around the time that Constantine split the empire, early in the fourth century. Whether it held a million then, as some claim, or about half that, it was still the biggest city on earth, surpassing contemporaries in China and Mexico, which had several hundred thousand each. Cities of millions are a recent phenomenon, dependent on mechanized transport. In the time of Henry VIII, the largest towns in Western Europe, Paris, London, Seville, held about 50,000 people each, the same as the Mesopotamian city of Uruk back in the days of Gilgamesh. When Queen Victoria died, there were only 16 cities in the world of one million or more, and now there are at least 400. All pre-industrial cities were constrained by the difficulty of getting supplies in and wastes out every day, a problem not always eased by horses and carts. The best solution was water transport by a network of canals, as in Venice and Aztec Mexico City. The unsavory truth is that until the mid-19th century, most cities were death traps, seething with disease, vermin, and parasites. Average life expectancy in ancient Rome was only 19 or 20 years, much lower than in Neolithic Chatalhuyuk, but slightly better than in Britain's black country, evoked so vividly by Charles Dickens, where the average fell as low as 17 or 18. Without a constant inflow of soldiers, slaves, merchants, and hopeful migrants, neither ancient Rome nor Georgian London could have kept its numbers up. Rome had several serious pandemics, possibly of Asian origin. While these caused manpower and fiscal problems, they may also have postponed the empire's decline by relieving pressure on the land. 
Explanations for Rome's fall run the gamut. Plagues, lead poisoning, mad emperors, corruption, barbarians, Christianity. And Joseph Tainter, in his book on social collapses, has added Parkinson's Law. Complex systems, he argues, inevitably succumb to diminishing returns. Even if other things remain equal, the costs of running and defending an empire eventually grow so burdensome that it becomes more efficient to throw off the whole imperial superstructure and revert to local forms of organization. By the time of Constantine, the imperial standing army was more than half a million men, an enormous drain on a treasury whose revenue depended mainly on agriculture, especially as many of the biggest landowners had been granted tax exemptions. The government's solution was to debase the currency used for payrolls. Eventually, the denarius, or Roman silver penny, contained so little silver that it became, in effect, paper money. Inflation of Weimar proportions ensued. At the beginning of the fourth century, it took 4,000 silver coins to buy one gold solidus. By the end of that century, it took 180 million. Citizens worn down by inflation and unfair taxation began defecting to the Goths. Because Rome was a literate society, we know of such woes as they affected higher levels of the human pyramid. But beneath the ills of the body politic lay a steady degradation of the natural pyramid that sustained the whole enterprise. Archaeological work in Italy and Spain has revealed severe erosion corresponding to high levels of agricultural activity during imperial times, followed by population collapse and abandonment until the late Middle Ages. As the empire impoverished the soils of southern Europe, Rome exported its environmental load to colonies, becoming dependent on grain from North Africa and the Middle East. The consequences can be seen in those regions today. Antioch, capital of Roman Syria, lies under some 30 feet of silt washed down from deforested hills, and the great Libyan ruins of Leptis Magna now stand in a desert. Rome's ancient bread baskets are filled with sand and dust. That is not, of course, the whole story. Rome controlled many environments, not all of which were exploited so destructively. Europe north of the Alps, with a wetter climate and heavy soils unsuited to the crude plows of the time, stayed lightly settled. Roman London was only half a square mile, and the spa town of Bath, whose walls impressed an early Eng English poet, whose walls impressed an early English poet as a kingly thing, the work of giants, covered only two dozen acres. Medieval history confirms the archaeological evidence. The empire fell hardest at its core, the Mediterranean basin, where the brunt of the environmental cost was born. Power then shifted to the periphery, where Germanic invaders, such as the Goths, Franks, and English, founded small ethnic states on northern lands that Rome had not exhausted. The great city itself was looted and half abandoned, the prize of endless barbarian and papal wars. Its population would not again reach half a million until the 20th century. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Alumni Theater at the University of King's College in Halifax, you're listening to Pyramid Schemes, the fourth of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. While Rome was conquering one quarter of humanity, another quarter, that living in the Americas, was, as I've noted, running similar social experiments. The largest city in the Americas at that time was Teotihuacan in central Mexico. Covering eight square miles with step pyramids flanking a broad ceremonial avenue at the axis of a grid, it was grander in layout than Rome itself, though smaller in population. Mesoamerican civilization had emerged about 1200 BC with the Olmecs of the Mexican Gulf. Their architecture, sculpture, and mathematics inspired both Teotihuacan and the Maya, a people who have lived in Guatemala, Yucatan, and Honduras for at least 4,000 years. 
Archaeologists define the Maya Classic Period as beginning about A.D. 200 with the rise of kingship and royal inscriptions. But Maya civilization was established long before that. A glyphic text from 400 B.C. has been found, and some of the biggest Maya temples ever built went up during the 2nd century B.C. at Kalakmul and El Mirador. The foundations of one building cover 22 acres, a footprint the size of the Roman city of Bath. Our stock image of the Maya, one that appeared at the end of the first Star Wars film, is of temples rearing like battered skyscrapers from an emerald jungle canopy. That scene was shot at the ruins of Tikal, the foremost Maya city of the late classic period, now a wildlife sanctuary for hundreds of bird species and rare animals such as ocelot and jaguar. 1,200 years ago, when those temples were last in daily use, little, if any, jungle would have been in sight. Like a Sumerian king atop his ziggurat, the lord of Tikal would have gazed out upon a man-made landscape, a dense urban core with half a dozen steep temples 200 feet high, then palaces and suburbs, then fields and farms stretching to the horizon where neighboring cities rose against the sky. As in other city-state systems, Maya civilization was internally competitive, artistically and intellectually fertile. The pre-classic Maya, along with the Olmecs, were the first people in the world to develop full positional numerals with the concept of naught or zero. This mathematical idea, which seems so obvious today, was invented only twice in history. It eluded the Greeks and all of Europe until the Arabic system, which had developed in India about AD 600, ousted cumbersome Roman numerals in the late Middle Ages. Mesoamerica was also one of only three or four places to invent writing, which the Maya developed into a phonetic as well as glyphic system. The other places were Sumer, China, and possibly Egypt. The rest of the world's script were either derived from these or stimulated by knowledge of writing's existence in a neighboring society. Using their advanced arithmetic in a calendar known as the Long Count, the Maya charted the mystery of time, recording astronomical events and running mythological calculations far into the past and future sometimes over millions of years. Calendars are power, as Julius Caesar, who named the month of July after himself, was also aware. Only three ancient Maya books have survived, but they are enough to reveal the most accurate astronomy until Europe's Renaissance, by which time Caesar's calendar had drifted ten days out of step with the sun. The social contract between Maya kings and their subjects was that through special knowledge and ritual, the rulers would keep earth in tune with heaven, ensuring good harvests and prosperity. They succeeded too well. By the height of the late classic period in the 8th century AD, rural populations were as dense as those in pre-industrial Southeast Asia. The Tikal kingdom alone may have held half a million people, depending on how its boundaries are defined. The other states, a dozen important ones and perhaps 50 more, were much smaller and seemed to have been arranged in shifting alliances rather like modern nations. Most Maya lived on the land in farmsteads, but even far from a city, they numbered up to 500 people a square mile on good land. It used to be a mystery how the fragile ecology of a tropical rainforest believed to have been cultivated by Swidden or Slash and Burn, could support such densities. It's now known that the Maya practiced intensive farming in swamps by a method called raised fields, cutting networks of canals and ditches to drain the land in the rainy season and water it in the dry. Fish were kept in these canals, whose dredgings were used as fertilizer, along with compost and sewage. As the Victorians in India coyly put it, Maya fields were self-manuring. Maya towns, like most small societies, had been communitarian at first, but a familiar social pyramid rose up with the pyramids of stone, and nature, of course, had to carry it all. Studies of ancient pollen confirm that as the cities grew, the jungle died by the stone axe. Cornfields spread and trees dwindled 
with a corresponding decline in game, the Maya's chief source of protein, apart from fish, turkeys, and an occasional hairless dog. By the middle of the classic period, only the upper class was eating much meat in the larger states. Each city had its distinctive style. Copan produced intricate sculpture. The statues of its kings, compared by Aldous Huxley to Chinese ivories, radiating order and refinement. Palenque's palaces were light and imaginative, embellished with bas-relief panels and finely modeled stucco. Tikal became a massive vertical place, its central buildings the tallest in the Americas until the late 19th century, a Manhattan of Art Deco towers. The resemblance isn't fanciful. Maya architecture influenced modern styles, especially early skyscraper forms and the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Now that Maya inscriptions can be read, they have dispelled old notions of classic period life as lofty and serene. For all the grand explorations of cosmic time, public texts are also royal propaganda, proclaiming births, accessions, deaths, victories, and coup d'etat. During the 8th century, as trouble begins to brew, these statements become more strident, betraying a scramble for power and resources in a shrinking world. Militarism takes hold. Old alliances break down. Dynasties become unstable. The ruling class exalts itself with extravagant building projects. The city of Tikal was built up over 1,500 years, but all the high towers that still watch over the forest went up in the city's final century, costly blooms on the eve of collapse. When the great cities wobbled, upstarts began to assert themselves, as in Greece during the Peloponnesian Wars. At the Maya town of Dos Pilas, which made a futile bid for power in the mid-8th century, diggings have unearthed a glimpse of the last days. People huddling in the central square, tearing stone from the temples to throw up barricades. Equally poignant are the wall paintings at the small city of Bonampak, which commissioned a set of frescoes to record a great victory in the 790s. The battle scene, drawn by a master, is among the liveliest and most skillful in ancient art. Afterwards, prisoners are displayed bleeding on the temple steps, along with a musical parade and scenes of royal women presenting the kingdom with an air. It is all so nouveau riche and so brief. The paintings were never finished. The caption blocks stayed unfilled, a silence more truthful than anything they might have told. One by one, the cities fell still, inscribing no more monuments, until on January the 18th, 909, in the Maya system, 10-4-0-0-0, the last date was carved, and the great machinery of the long count calendar ceased to revolve. So what went wrong? As in Rome, all the usual suspects, war, drought, disease, soil exhaustion, invasion, trade disruption, peasant revolt, have been questioned. Some of these are too sudden to account for a collapse that took more than a century. But many of these things would flow from ecological malaise. Again, sediment studies show widespread erosion. There are no goats to blame in this case but small losses each year still added up to bankruptcy. Stone axes are slower than steel, and hoes gentler than plows, but enough of them will do the same job in the end. The fertility of a rainforest is mainly in the trees. Modern clearing in Amazonia shows that tropical loam can be destroyed in a few years. The Maya understood their soils and conserved them better than today's chainsaw settlers do, but eventually demand overtook supply. David Webster, who has excavated at several major sites and written a recent book on the Maya Fall, says this about the greatest of the city-states. The most convincing collapse explanation we have for the Tikal kingdom is overpopulation and agrarian failure with all of their attendant political consequences. Webster's conclusion holds for most of the central lowlands. The ornate Maya city of Copan, which stands in a Honduran valley surrounded by steep hills, fell into a common trap, one that is costing millions of acres around the world today. The city 
began as a small village on good bottom land beside a river, a rational and harmless settlement pattern at first. But as it grew, it paved over more and more of its best land. Farmers were driven up onto fragile hillside soils whose anchoring timber had been cleared. As the city died, so much silt washed down that whole houses and streets were buried. Human bones from classic sites show a growing divide between rich and poor, the wealthy getting taller and heavier while the peasants became stunted. Towards the end, all classes seem to have suffered a general decline in health and life expectancy. If we had Maya mummies to examine, we would probably find them riddled with parasites and the ills of malnutrition, like ancient Egyptians. Webster believes that at the height of Copan's magnificence, during the long reign of King Yashpasach, life expectancy was short, mortality was high, people were often sick, malnourished, and decrepit looking. House remains show that in a century and a half, Copan's population had shot up from about 5,000 to 28,000, peaking in A.D. 800. It stayed high for one century, then fell by half in 50 years, then dropped to nearly nothing by A.D. 1200. We can't attribute these figures to mass migration in or out, for much the same pattern occurs throughout the Maya area. The graph, Webster observes, closely resembles the kind of boom and bust cycle associated with wild animal populations. He might also have compared it to something more immediate. Copan's five-fold surge in just one century and a half is exactly the same rate of increase as the modern world's leap from 1.2 billion in 1850 to 6 billion in 2000. Some scholars attribute the Maya fall to a severe drought early in the ninth century, a Maya dust bowl. Yet collapse in several areas had already begun by then. During their peak in the eighth century, the great cities of the Maya heartland were running at the limit. They had cashed in all their natural capital. The forest was cut, the fields worn out, the population too high, and the building boom made matters worse, taking more land and timber. Their situation was unstable, vulnerable to any downturn in natural systems. A drought, even if it was no worse than others the Maya had weathered before, would have been more of a finishing blow than a cause. As the crisis gathered, the response of the rulers was not to seek a new course, to cut back on royal and military expenditures, to put effort into land reclamation through terracing, or to encourage birth control, methods of which the Maya may have known. No, they dug in their heels and carried on doing what they had always done, only more so. Their solution was higher pyramids, more power to the kings, harder work for the masses, more foreign wars. In modern terms, the Maya elite became extremists or ultra-conservatives, squeezing the last drops of profit from nature and humanity. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Alumni Theater at the University of King's College in Halifax, you're listening to Pyramid Schemes, the fourth of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. Of the four cases we've looked at so far, two, Easter Island and Sumer, failed to recover because their ecologies were unable to regenerate. The other two, Rome and the Maya, collapsed heavily in their heartlands, where ecological demand had been highest, but left remnant societies whose descendants have come down to modern times. During a thousand years of low population, the land in both places managed to recover, helped by volcanic ash falls and pandemics. Italy is no Easter Island, and Guatemala is no Sumer. There's a riddle here. Why, if civilizations so often destroy themselves, has the overall experiment of civilization done so well? If Rome couldn't feed itself in the long run, how is it possible that for every person on earth in Roman times, there are 30 here today? Natural regeneration and human migration are part of the answer. Ancient civilizations were local, feeding on particular ecologies. As one fell, another would be rising elsewhere. 
large tracts of the planet were still very lightly settled. A fast film of the Earth from space would show civilizations breaking out like forest fires in one region after another. Some were isolated and spontaneous. Others were carried from place to place across the centuries, sparks on the cultural wind. A few flared a second time in a good place after a long fallow, rekindling from old coals. A second answer is that while most civilizations have outrun natural limits and collapsed within a thousand years or so, not all have. Egypt and China were able to keep burning without using up their natural fuel for more than 3,000 years. What made them different? Egypt, as Herodotus wrote, was the gift of the Nile. Her fields watered and her soils refreshed each year by a layer of flood-borne silt. Desert hills hemming the river on both sides showed from the start what the limits of tillage would be. There were no wooded slopes or jungles to tempt a population boom on fleeting soils. The Nile and its delta offered only 15,000 square miles of cropland, an area the size of Holland drawn out in the shape of a lotus with its head touching the sea. Egypt's farming methods were simple as conservative as the culture itself, working with rather than against the natural water cycle. The Nile Valley's narrowness and drainage slowed the salt buildup that poisoned Sumer. And unlike the Maya and ourselves, ancient Egyptians generally knew better than to build on farmland. Egypt's population growth was also unusually slow. Throughout the Pharaonic, Roman, and Arabic periods, it stayed well below world average, taking 3,000 years to rise from below 2 million to about 6 million by Cleopatra's time, and rising no further until the 19th century when modern irrigation began. This tells us that 6 million people, or 400 per square mile of farmland, was the carrying capacity of the Nile ecosystem, a limit grimly enforced by famine when the river faltered and by high levels of waterborne disease. Nature made Egypt live within its means. But Egypt's means were those of a remittance man, topped up each year by the Nile at the expense of other farming peoples upstream in the Ethiopian highlands. China also received more than her fair share of topsoil, though it had come as a lump sum deposit rather than a yearly allowance. Long before farming began, dry winds blowing across the Eurasian landmass had picked up topsoil exposed by retreating glaciers and dropped it on China in the form of Lewis, a lion-colored earth that gives the Yellow River its name. The deposits lie hundreds of feet thick in fertile plateaus carved here and there into precipitous ravines or spread out in alluvial plains below. This land was almost endlessly forgiving, with erosion merely exposing new layers of good earth. Civilization in China began more than a thousand years after Egypt, but soon overtook it in scale and spread into other climatic zones. At the height of the Han Empire, China ruled 50 million people from Mongolia to Vietnam, the same number as Rome, its contemporary and distant trading partner. The Han Dynasty's fall in the third century AD was more political than ecological in cause. China was soon revitalized with new ideas from India and the spread in the south of rice paddy farming, one of the most productive agrarian systems ever devised. Even so, if we were to scrutinize Egypt and China more closely, we'd find them less steady than they seem from afar. Around 2000 BC, for instance, a series of low Nile floods sparked famine and revolts, toppling the old kingdom. In China, too, hungry peasants rebelled against oppressive elites. On one occasion, fraught with social irony, they dug into an emperor's tomb, stole weapons from the hands of his terracotta army, and used them to overthrow the Jin dynasty. Despite such upsets and the recurring scythes of famine and disease, the generous ecologies of Egypt and China allowed revival to follow before the culture lost its headway. A culture, said W.H. Auden, is no better than its woods. Civilizations have developed many techniques for making the earth produce more food, some sustainable, others not. The lesson I read in the past is this, that the health of land and water, and of woods, which are the keepers of water, 
can be the only lasting basis for any civilization's survival and success. Eventually, from rags of woodland left in buffer zones between the fallen city-states, the Maya jungle grew back. A family squatting in an empty palace at Tikal, as some did in the aftermath, would have seen thorns and saplings reclaiming the old fields, seen the bush edging into the streets, and heard the weary voices of returning wildlife. Reflecting on the slow revival of fertility and its eventual promise, they might have agreed with Kafka, there is hope, though not for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. As I mentioned at the beginning, Ron has agreed to, ask, or to answer questions. Uh, we have two microphones set up, as you see, in the middle of the house. Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question here in Halifax? You say, I think, in your book, we don't seem to learn, but every time history repeats itself, the price goes up. Uh, it's pretty hard. With all my gurus and teachers and peers telling me this ship is sinking and there is no lifeboat, uh, to go about my ordinary daily affairs and not be completely depressed. Um, uh, help. <laughs> well, very well said, and I share that feeling entirely. My form of therapy was to write these lectures. <laughs> but uh, it's not too late. We have the, 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 the knowledge, we have the wealth, uh, and, and a critical piece of this knowledge is that we know how these past societies collapsed. We know what happened to them, and I think uh, any thinking person can recognize those patterns. And a lot of the, pro the trouble is the momentum of a certain kind of economic and political system that works at a certain scale, but when it gets to a huge scale, it becomes a suicide machine. And, and that's what's happened to these people in the past in most cases, and it's what seems to be happening to us. Um, but we know that. They didn't. The other civilizations had very little reliable knowledge of the past and didn't even know about each other's existence most of the time. Uh, so we know this, and we still have democracies. Uh, I think the, the short-term electoral cycle needs to be tinkered with in some way so that we, we don't encourage politicians only to think in three- or four-year cycles because what's needed now is very long-range thinking. And somehow we need to involve people who aren't beholden to a quick fix to get that thinking on the agenda. In 1998, the, the, U, the UN published a report. The net worth of the three richest individuals, who at that time happened to be all Americans, was equal to that of the poorest 48 countries. Now, I don't think there has ever been a time in, in the whole of human history when the gap between the people at the top and those at the bottom was as great as that. I think that the sort of, it's hard to calculate what wealth means in ancient societies, but that seems to me a lot bigger than the gap between the pharaoh and the guy dragging the block of stone for the pyramid. So the, the, the difference between rich and poor has become obscene. It is particularly bad in the United States, and it's got much worse only in the past 20 years. I mean, we had uh, in the 1970s the ratio of income between a shop floor worker in a major American industry and the CEO at the top. The ratio between their salaries was about 1 to 30 or 1 to 35. Now it's 1 to 1,000. Um, so what's happening, and this is what's destroyed all these cultures in the past, is that Wealth and power get concentrated upwards, and that means there's never enough to go around at the bottom. So there is always a desperate scramble at the bottom and a desperate scramble to accumulate new f types of wealth and power, which just literally gobbles up the environment. So we've got to get off that kind of uh, that treadmill. That is the problem. I mean, I think we only have to get back to the kind of social consensus and sense of the public good and the sense that governments have a job to do that private self-interested private corporations cannot do. We have to get back to the notion of the public good in public hands. And I don't think that's impossible.
on ideas tonight from the Alumni Theatre at King's College in Halifax. You've been listening to Pyramid Schemes, the fourth of the 2004 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright, and the lecture series is called A Short History of Progress. Tomorrow night's lecture, The Rebellion of the Tools, will come from the Macmillan Theatre in the University of Toronto. The 2004 Massey Lectures are published as a book by the House of Anansi Press, and Ronald Wright is taking part in an online forum to discuss the lectures at www.anansi.ca. You can purchase the Massey Lectures either as a book or a CD by calling Ideas Transcripts and using your credit card. The number to call is 416-205-7367. Taxes and shipping are included, and the book costs $23.95. The five CDs sell in stores for $49.95, but you can buy it through Ideas Transcripts for the special price of $44.95, which also includes taxes and shipping. Again, the number to call is 416 205 7367. Tonight's lecture was recorded by John Dalton with technician Pat Martin. Our partners in the Massey Lectures are the House of Anansi Press and Massey College in the University of Toronto. The Massey Lectures were produced for Ideas by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht, and I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned to CBC Radio 1 for the hourly news, followed by the Arts Tonight and Between the Covers. Good evening and welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy and tonight we're in Toronto for the final lecture on this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. We're in the Macmillan Theatre on the campus of the University of Toronto, and there are over 800 people here tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the fifth and last of this year's Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country what it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. This year, the Massey lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cutstones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight, from the Macmillan Theatre at the University of Toronto, The Rebellion of the Tools, the last of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. I have a weakness for cynical graffiti, and I mean reading them, not scribbling them. One relevant to the hazards of progress is this. Each time history repeats itself, the price goes up. The collapse of the first civilization on Earth, that of the Sumerians in what is now southern Iraq, affected only half a million people. The fall of Rome affected tens of millions, and if ours were to fail, it would, of course, bring catastrophe on billions. So far in these talks, I've looked at four ancient societies, Sumer, Rome, the Maya, and Easter Island, which in roughly a thousand years each wore out their welcome from nature and collapsed. I've also mentioned two exceptions, Egypt and China, who achieved a run of 3,000 years or more. 
In his book on past collapses, Joseph Tainter nicknames three kinds of trouble, the runaway train, the dinosaur, and the house of cards. These usually act together. The Sumerian's irrigation was certainly a runaway train, a disastrous course from which they could not deviate. Their ruler's failure to tackle the problem qualifies them as dinosaurs, and the civilization's swift and irreparable fall shows it to have been a house of cards. Much the same can be said of the other failures. We are faced by something deeper than mistakes at any particular time or place. The invention of agriculture is itself a runaway train, leading to vastly expanded populations, but seldom solving the food problem because of two inevitable or nearly inevitable consequences. The first is biological. The population grows until it hits the bounds of the food supply. The second is social. All civilizations become hierarchical. The upward concentration of wealth ensures that there can never be enough to go around. Thomas Malthus explored the first dilemma, and thinkers from Christ to Marx have touched on the second. As the Chinese saying has it, the peasant must stand a long time on the hillside with his mouth open before a roast duck flies in. <laughs> Civilization is an experiment, a very recent way of life in the human career. And it has a habit of walking into what I'm calling progress traps. A small village on good land beside a river is a good idea. But when the village grows into a city and paves over the good land, it becomes a bad idea. While prevention might have been easy, a cure may be impossible. This human inability to foresee long-range consequences may be inherent to our kind, shaped by the millions of years when we lived hand-to-mouth by hunting and gathering. It may also be little more than a mix of inertia, greed, and foolishness encouraged by the shape of the social pyramid. The concentration of power at the top of large-scale societies gives the elite a vested interest in the status quo. They continue to prosper in darkening times long after the environment and general populace begin to suffer. Yet despite the wreckage of past civilizations littering the earth, the overall experiment of civilization has continued to spread and grow. The numbers, insofar as they can be estimated, break down roughly as follows. A world population of 200 million or so at Rome's height in the second century AD. About 400 million by the year 1500 when Europe reached the Americas. One billion by 1825 at the start of the Coal Age. Two billion by 1925 when the Oil Age gets underway. And six billion by the year 2000. Even more startling than the growth is the acceleration. Adding 200 million after Rome took 13 centuries. Adding the latest 200 million took three years. We tend to regard our age as exceptional, and in many ways it is. But the parochialism of the present, the way our eyes follow the ball and not the game, is dangerous. Absorbed in the here and now, we lose sight of our course through time, forgetting to ask ourselves Paul Gauguin's final question, where are we going? If so many previous ages ran into natural limits and crashed, how has our runaway train, if that's what it is, been able to keep on gathering speed? I suggested earlier that the Chinese and Egyptian civilizations were exceptionally long-lived because nature gave them lavish subsidies of extra topsoil brought in by wind and water from elsewhere. But some credit must go to human ingenuity. The number of mouths an acre of land can support and the length of time it can go on supporting them 
doesn't depend only on natural fertility. Civilization did get better at farming as it went along. Crop rotation and the use of green manure, the plowing under of nitrogen-fixing plants, raised yields considerably in early modern times. The Asian development of wet rice cultivation was highly productive, and its precisely leveled paddy fields encouraged sustainable tillage on hillsides. The Islamic civilization of Spain not only handed down classical learning to late medieval Europe, it also healed the stricken landscape Rome had left behind by building olive terraces and advanced irrigation schemes. In the Andes, the Incas and pre-Incas built an efficient mountain agriculture on flights of stone terraces watered by glacial streams and fertilized with guano, which they mined from ancient seabird rookeries on arid coastal islands. Studies of Andean terracing in use for the past 1,500 years show no loss of fertility. Such steady improvements in farming methods can explain a steady rise in population, but not the great boom of the past few centuries. Mechanization and sanitation may account for later stages of the boom, but not its beginnings, which predate farm machinery and public health. The takeoff point was about one century after Columbus, and this was when the strange fruits of the Spanish conquest began to be digested. Europe received the greatest subsidy of all when half a planet, fully developed but almost unprotected, fell suddenly into its hands. If America had been a wilderness, the invaders wouldn't have got much out of it for a long time. Every field would have had to be won from the forest, every crop imported and adapted, every mine discovered, every road cut across trackless desert and ranges. But this unknown world had had its own Neolithic revolution and had built a series of civilizations on a rich agrarian base. The three Americas, North, Central, and South, formed a complex world, much like Asia, teeming with 80 to 100 million people between a fifth and a fourth of the human race in 1492. The most powerful polities were the Aztec Empire, a city-state system dominated by the conurbation known as Mexico, and the Inca Empire stretching 3,000 miles down the spine of the Andes and Pacific coast. Each of these had roughly 20 million people, which puts them midway in scale between ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. With a quarter million citizens, the Aztec capital was the biggest city in the Americas and one of the half dozen biggest in the world. The Inca Empire was less urban, but tightly organized with paved roads, a command economy, and vast terracing and irrigation projects built by a labor tax system rather than slavery. Though hardly a worker's paradise, it soon began to look like one to survivors under Spanish rule. Both these empires were young, the heirs of others, and might have had centuries ahead of them if no outsiders had arrived. But they awaited intruders like orchards of ripe fruit. The environmental historians Alfred Crosby and William McNeil showed in the 1970s that the New World's true conquerors were germs, mass killers such as smallpox, measles, and bubonic plague. These arrived for the first time with the Europeans who had resistance to them and acted like biological weapons, killing the rulers and at least half the populations of Mexico and Peru in the first wave. Crosby wrote, the miraculous triumphs of the conquistadors are in large part the triumphs of the smallpox virus. Despite their guns and horses, the Spaniards did not achieve any major conquests on the mainland until after a smallpox pandemic had swept through. Before that, the Maya, Aztecs, Incas, and Floridians all repelled the first efforts to invade them. Some years ago, the Pentagon came up with plans for a, a strange Lovian weapon called the neutron bomb 
to be let off high over Russian cities so that a searing blast of radiation would kill all the people but leave the property unharmed. The European invaders of America had a weapon of exactly this effect in disease. Let nobody say the New World went down without a fight. The battles for Mexico and Cusco were among the hardest ever fought. But once the epidemiological veil was torn, the people became too few to defend what their ancestors had built up for 10,000 years. They died in heaps like bedbugs, wrote a Spanish friar in Mexico. Except for the Great Plains and cold regions, even North America was not wild in 1500. Hollywood may have persuaded us that the typical Indian was a nomadic hunter. But in truth, all temperate zones of the United States, from the southwest to the southeast and north to Missouri, Ohio, and the Great Lakes, were thickly settled by farming peoples. When the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts, the Indians had died out so recently that the whites found empty houses, winter corn, and cleared fields waiting for their use, a foretoken of the settlers' parasitic advance across the continent. Europeans did not find a wilderness here. American historian Francis Jennings has written, they made one. For the Spanish, disease was a better weapon than a neutron bomb because just enough Amerindians survived to work the mines. The Aztec and Inca treasures were only a down payment on all the gold and silver that would flow across the Atlantic for centuries. Karl Marx was among the first economists to see that financially, the Industrial Revolution begins with Atahualpa's gold. An indispensable condition for the establishment of manufacturing industry, he wrote in 1847, was the discovery of America and the importation of its precious metals. The bankers who underwrote Spain's empire were awash in bullion. Much found its way to northern Europe, financing shipbuilding, gun foundries, and other imperial ventures. Much also went on European wars, and wars between peers are mothers of invention. In a way, Mao Zedong didn't intend. Power would indeed grow from the barrel of a gun. From the cannon's reeking tube descends the cylinder of the steam and petrol engines. Gold and silver formed just one side of a transatlantic triangle of loot, land, and labor. The New World's widowed acres, and above all, its crops, would prove far more valuable than its metal in the long run. At their Thanksgiving dinners, devout Americans thank their God for feeding them in a wilderness. They then devour a huge meal of turkey, maize, beans, squash, pumpkin, and potatoes. All these foods, unknown to pre-Columbian Europe and presumably its God, had been developed over thousands of years by New World civilizations. It's also hard to imagine curry without chilies, Italian food without tomatoes, the Swiss with no chocolate, and the British with fish but no chips. <laughs> Besides their effect on diet, the new crops brought a dramatic rise in output in Africa and Asia as well as in Europe. Maize and potatoes are about twice as productive as wheat and barley. Populations rose and large numbers of people left the farm, generating labor surpluses from Britain to the Gold Coast. In the north, these people ended up in mills and factories, while in Africa, they became foreign exchange for manufactured goods, especially guns. Later, Europe also began exporting surplus people to fill the prairies and the pampas. With the invention of farm machinery, the old world grains became less labor intensive. And with the rediscovery and worldwide use of guano, another gift of Inca agriculture, crop yields soared. And when the guano deposits and other natural fertilizers were exhausted, commercial farming became almost entirely dependent on chemical fertilizers made from oil and gas. 
Fossil energy not only powers, but feeds the modern world. We are actually eating oil. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Macmillan Theater at the University of Toronto, you're listening to The Rebellion of the Tools, the fifth and last of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. We will never know when, where, or even whether the Industrial Revolution would have happened had America not existed. My guess is that it would, but later and more gradually. It might have begun in China rather than Europe, or in both but that's for the what-if school of history. All we can say is that things would have been very different. So the world we have today is the gift of the new world. The Americas then really were El Dorado, and they were also utopia. Early reports of Amazonian societies influenced Sir Thomas More's book of that name, published in 1516. A century later, the best-selling writer Garcilaso de la Vega, who was half Inca, promoted his mother's fallen empire as the ideal state. In North America, the influence was much more direct, a matter of daily example. The early frontier culture was a hybrid, a place where Indians grew orchards and whites took up scalping. Settlers fought, traded, and intermarried with self-governing native peoples who practiced social equality, free debate in council, and the rule of consensus. Their whole constitution breathes nothing but liberty, wrote James Adair of the Cherokees in 1775. Benjamin Franklin made similar observations about the Iroquois Confederacy, which he urged the 13 colonies to emulate. The whites were particularly impressed by the way dissenters would simply leave the rest of their nation and form an independent group. Here, spread before the eyes of colonists resentful of a distant crown, were freedom, democracy, and the right of secession. It was, and still is, not well known that those native democracies were largely a post-Columbian development blooming in the open spaces left by the great dying of the 1500s. Most of the eastern farming tribes were remnants of once powerful chiefdoms. Had the English come to America before its demographic collapse, they would have found a more familiar social structure. Lords who lived in great houses atop hundred-foot earthen pyramids, who were carried about on litters, and were buried with slaves and concubines. The smallpox virus having overthrown such societies along with the Aztec and Inca empires therefore played a precursory role in the American Revolution. Most uprisings are sparked by want. The American rebels were inspired by plenty, by Indian land and Indian ideals. In more than one way, Benjamin Franklin's countrymen became, as he called them, white savages. The American Revolution in turn influenced the French Revolution, which had its own white savagery known as the Terror. Governments keen to avoid more of the same began broadening the franchise throughout the following century. A measure of participation filtered grudgingly down the social pyramid, while the new industrial economy nourished a growing middle class. We in the lucky countries of the West now regard our two-century bubble of freedom and affluence as normal and inevitable. It's even been called the end of history in both a temporal and teleological sense. Yet this new order is an anomaly, the opposite of what normally happens as civilizations grow. So our age was bankrolled by the seizing of half a planet, extended by taking over most of the remaining half, and sustained by spending down new forms of natural capital, especially fossil fuel. In the New World, the West hit the biggest bonanza of all time, and there won't be another like it. 
not unless we find the civilized Martians of H.G. Wells, complete with the vulnerability to our germs that undid them in his War of the Worlds. The experiment of civilization has long had its doubters. The tales of Icarus, Prometheus, and Pandora illustrate the risks of being too clever by half, a theme also known to Genesis. Perhaps the most insightful ancient story of this kind, particularly as it comes from a civilization that had suffered collapse, is the rebellion of the tools in the Maya creation epic, the Popol Vuh, where human beings are overthrown by their farm and household implements. And all those things began to speak. You shall feel our strength. We shall grind and tear your flesh to pieces, said their grinding stones. At the same time, their griddles and pots spoke up. Pain and suffering you have caused us. You burned us as if we felt no pain. Now you shall feel it. We shall burn you. As the Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier pointed out, this is our first explicit warning of the threat in the machine. Such warnings became common in the 19th century when, for the first time ever, wrenching technical and social change was felt within a single lifetime. Mary Shelley pondered the new science with her Frankenstein, and Charles Dickens gave the social costs of industry a scolding and prescient critique in hard times, foreseeing the new religion of the bottom line. Every inch of the existence of mankind from birth to death, he wrote in 1854, was to be a bargain across a counter. In his 1872 novel, Erewhon, Samuel Butler created a remote civilization that had industrialized long before Europe, but where the effects of progress sparked a Luddite revolution. The great danger, wrote an Erewhon radical, was not so much the existing machines as the speed at which they were evolving. If not stopped in time, they might develop language, reproduce themselves, and subjugate mankind. Butler was sending up Darwinism here, but the anxieties stirred by the panting monsters of the steam age were real enough. Years before he became prime minister, the young Benjamin Disraeli had anticipated Erewhon's fears in his novel, Coningsby. The mystery of mysteries, he wrote, is to view machines making machines, a spectacle that fills the mind with curious and even awful speculation. As the Victorian age rushed on, many writers began to ask, where are we going? If so much was happening so quickly in their century, what might happen in the next? Butler, Wells, William Morris, and many others mixed fantasy, satire, and allegory to create a genre known as the scientific romance. In The Time Machine of 1895, Wells sent a traveler to a distant future where the human race has split into two species, the Eloi and the Morlocks. The Eloi are a, a sybaritic upper class living brainlessly on the industrial toil of the Morlocks, never guessing that these underground subhumans, seemingly their slaves, are in fact raising them for meat. In his News from Nowhere, William Morris, perhaps better known nowadays for wallpaper, dreamt up a post-industrial new age, a utopia of honest workmanship and free love, from which he attacked the first great wave of globalization, the world market ruled by the steamship, the telegraph, and the British. The happiness of the workman at his work, his most elementary comfort and bare health, did not weigh a grain of sand in the balance against this dire necessity of cheap production of things, a great part of which were not worth producing at all. The whole community was cast into the jaws of this ravening monster, the world market. 
While we may learn from the past, we don't seem to learn much. That last generation before the First World War was in many ways a time like ours, an old century grown tired, a new century in which moralities and certainties were withering, terrorists were lurking in the shadows, and industrialists declaiming from their mansions that free enterprise would spread a new Jerusalem to all. More thoughtful observers sensed that change was running out of control and began to fear that with the powers of industry, mankind had found the means to suicide. They saw jingoistic nation-states engaged in an arms race. They saw social exploitation and vast urban slums, contaminated air and water, and civilization being conferred on savages through the barrels of machine guns. What if those guns were turned not on Zulus or, or Sioux, but on other Europeans? What if the degradation of the slums caused degeneration of the human race? What exactly was the point of all this economic output if, for so many people, it meant deracination, misery, and filth? By the end of his voyage, Wells' time traveler regards civilization as only a foolish heaping that must inevitably destroy its makers in the end. No doubt many will say that we stand here to prove those gloomy Victorians wrong. But do we? They may have been wrong on the details they imagined for our times, but they were right to foresee trouble. Just ahead lay the Great War and 12 million dead, the Russian Revolution, the Great Slump, leading to Hitler, the death camps, the Second World War with 50 million dead, the atom bomb. And these in turn to the Korean War, the Cold War, the near-fatal Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam, Cambodia, Rwanda. Even the most pessimistic Victorian might have been surprised to learn that the 20th century would slaughter more than 100 million in its wars, twice the entire population of the Roman Empire. The price of history does indeed go up. The Victorian scientific romances had two modern descendants, mainstream science fiction and profound social satire set in nightmare futures. The latter includes several of the last century's most important books, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984, and J.M. Coetzee's Waiting for the Barbarians, plus a number of post-nuclear wastelands of which Russell Hoban's Ridley Walker has to be the masterpiece. With the nuclear threat fading, maybe, modern apocalyptic novels have revisited concerns first raised before Hiroshima, especially the risks of new technology. The clanking monsters of everyone have now taken subtler forms that threaten the whole biosphere. Climate disruption, toxic waste, new pathogens, nanotechnology, cybernetics, genetic engineering. One of the dangers of writing a dystopian satire is how depressing it is when you get things right. Ten years ago, I began working on my novel, A Scientific Romance, a title I chose to acknowledge the Victorians and because my theme was our love affair with science. For satirical purposes, I made what I thought were wild extrapolations. I had a character die of mad cow disease, thinking that in the final draft, I would probably have to kill her off with something less far-fetched. By the time the book was published in 1997, Dozens of people really had died of mad cow. Other elements of the satire. Climate change that turns wintry London into a tropical swamp. A race of genetically modified survivors. And a GM grass that doesn't need mowing because it has the self-limiting properties of human pubic hair no longer seem, <laughs> no longer seem quite the funhouse mirrors they were when I began. And just a few months ago, something more specific came to haunt me. 
In the jungly ruins of London, my protagonist finds a street blocked off and buildings fortified with concrete slabs. And here he deduces an embattled British government must have spent its final days in the 2030s. Earlier this year, I read in the Globe and Mail that Tony Blair's government is planning to surround the Houses of Parliament with a 15-foot concrete wall and razor wire. I don't want to be a prophet, and I certainly don't claim to be. It doesn't take Nostradamus to foresee that walls will go up in times of crisis, though the thickest walls are in the mind. A telling feature of the real mad cow disaster was how long the British government did nothing except hope for the best. In her recent dystopia, Oryx and Crake, which concentrates on biotechnology, Margaret Atwood also portrays the collapse of civilization in the near future. One of her characters asks, as a species, we're doomed by hope then. By hope? Well, yes. Hope drives us to invent new fixes for old messes, which in turn create ever more dangerous messes. Hope elects the politician with the biggest empty promise. Hope, like greed, fuels the engine of capitalism. John Steinbeck once said that socialism never took root in America because the poor see themselves not as an exploited proletariat, but as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. <laughs> this helps explain why American culture is so hostile to the idea of limits, why voters during the last energy shortage rejected the sweater-wearing Jimmy Carter and elected Ronald Reagan, who scoffed at conservation and told them it was still morning in America. Nowhere does the myth of progress have more fervent believers. Marx was surely right when he called capitalism almost admiringly a machine for demolishing limits. Both communism and capitalism are materialist utopias offering rival versions of an earthly paradise. In practice, Communism was no easier on the natural environment, but at least it proposed a sharing of the goods. Capitalism lures us onward like the mechanical hare before the greyhounds, insisting that the economy is infinite and sharing therefore irrelevant. Just enough greyhounds catch a hare now and then to keep the others running till they drop. In the past, it was only the poor who lost this game. Now, it is the planet. Those who traveled in their youth and have gone back to old haunts after 20 or 30 years can't fail to observe the massive onslaught of progress, whether it be the loss of farms to suburbs, rivers to dams, mountains to cement quarries, or coral reefs to condominiums. We still have differing cultures and political systems, but at the economic level, there is now only one big civilization, feeding on the whole planet's natural capital. We're logging everywhere, fishing everywhere, irrigating everywhere, building everywhere, and no corner of the biosphere escapes our hemorrhage of waste. The 20-fold growth in world trade since the 1970s has eliminated self-sufficiency. Every El Dorado has been looted, every Shangri-La equipped with a Holiday Inn. Joseph Tainter, and he was writing his book on collapses in 1988, noted this interdependence, warning that collapse, if and when it comes again, will this time be global. World civilization will disintegrate as a whole. Experts in a range of fields have begun to see the same closing door of opportunity, begun to warn that these years may be the last when civilization still has the wealth and political cohesion to steer itself towards caution, conservation, and social justice. About 12 years ago, just before the Rio Environmental Summit that led to the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change, more than half the world's Nobel laureates warned that we might have only a decade or so left to make our system sustainable. Now, in a report unsuccessfully hushed up by the Bush administration, the Pentagon, hardly a nest of tree huggers, <laughs> is, is predicting worldwide famine 
anarchy, and warfare within a generation should climate change fulfill the more severe projections. And in his 2003 book, Our Final Century, Martin Rees of Cambridge University, astronomer royal and former president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, concludes, the odds are no better than 50-50 that our present civilization will survive to the end of the present century unless all nations adopt low-risk and sustainable policies. Skeptics point to earlier predictions of disaster that weren't borne out, but that is a fool's paradise. Some of our escapes from nuclear war, for one, have been more by luck than judgment and are not final. Other problems have been sidestepped but not solved. The food crisis, for example, has merely been postponed by switching to hybrid seed and chemical farming at great cost to soil health and plant diversity. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. From the Macmillan Theatre at the University of Toronto, you're listening to The Rebellion of the Tools, the fifth and last of Ronald Wright's 2004 Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. Following the attacks of September the 11th, 2001, the world's media and politicians focused, understandably, on terrorism. Two things need to be said here. First, terrorism is a small threat compared with hunger, disease, or climate change. 3,000 died in the United States that day. 25,000 die every day in the world from contaminated water alone. Each year, 18 million babies are born mentally impaired by malnourishment. Each year, an area of farmland greater than Scotland is lost to erosion and urban sprawl, much of it in Asia. Second, terrorism cannot be stopped by addressing symptoms, yet not the cause. Violence is bred by injustice, poverty, inequality, and other violence. This lesson was learned very painfully in the first half of the 20th century at a cost of some 80 million lives. Of course, a full belly and a fair hearing won't stop a fanatic, but they can greatly reduce the number who become fanatics. After the Second World War, a consensus emerged to deal with the roots of violence by creating international institutions and democratically managed forms of capitalism based on Keynesian economics and America's New Deal. This policy, though far from perfect, succeeded in Europe, Japan, and some parts of the Third World. Remember when we spoke not of a war on terror, but of a war on want. To undermine that post-war consensus and return to archaic political patterns is to walk back into the bloody past. Yet that is what the new right has achieved since the late 1970s, rewrapping old ideas as new and using them to transfer the levers of power from elected governments to unelected corporations, a project sold as tax-cutting and deregulation by the rights courtiers in the media, of which Canada certainly has its share. The conceit of laissez-faire economics, that if you let the horses guzzle enough oats, something will go through for the sparrows. That was John Kenneth Galbraith, not me. (laughs) Has been tried many times and has failed many times, leaving ruin and social wreckage. Taxes in most countries have not, in fact, been lowered. They were merely shifted down the income pyramid and diverted from aid and social programs towards military and corporate ones. The great American judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, once said, I don't mind paying taxes. They buy me civilization. Public confidence in a basic social safety net is essential for lowering birth rates in poor nations and for a decent society in all nations. The removal of that confidence has set off a free-for-all that is stripping the earth. The revolt against redistribution is killing our future. During the 20th century, as I noted earlier in these talks, the world's population multiplied by four and the economy by more than 40. If the promise of modernity was even treading water, In other words, if the gap between rich and poor 
had stayed proportionally the same as it was when Queen Victoria died, all human beings would be ten times better off. Yet the number in abject poverty today is as great as all mankind in 1901. By the end of the 20th century, the world's three richest individuals, all of whom happened to be Americans, had a combined net wealth greater than that of the poorest 48 countries. In 1998, the United Nations calculated that 40 billion US dollars spent carefully could provide clean water, sanitation, and other basic needs for the poorest on earth. The figure may be optimistic, and it may have grown in the past six years, but it's still considerably less than the funds already set aside for the wasteful fantasy of a missile shield that won't work, isn't needed, yet could provoke a new arms race and the militarization of space. Consider Joseph Tainter's three modes of collapse, the runaway train, the dinosaur, the house of cards. The rise in population and pollution, the acceleration of technology, the concentration of wealth and power, all are runaway trains, and most are linked together. Population growth is slowing, but by 2050 there will still be three billion more on Earth. We may be able to feed that many in the short run, but we'll have to raise less meat, which takes 10 pounds of food to make one pound of food, and we'll have to spread that food around. What we can't do is keep consuming as we are, or polluting as we are. We could help countries such as India and China industrialize without repeating our mistakes. But instead, we exclude environmental standards from trade agreements. Like sex tourists with unlawful lusts, we do our dirtiest work among the poor. If civilization is to survive, it must live on the interest, not the capital, of nature. Ecological markers suggest that in the early 1960s, humans were using about 70% of nature's yearly output. By the early 1980s, we'd reached 100%. And in 1999, we were at 125%. Now, such numbers may be imprecise, but the trend is clear. They mark the road to bankruptcy. None of this should surprise us after reading the flight recorders in the wreckage of crashed civilizations. Our present behavior is typical of failed societies at the zenith of their greed and arrogance. This is the dinosaur factor, hostility to change from vested interests and inertia at all social levels. George Soros, the reformed currency speculator, calls the economic dinosaurs market fundamentalists. I'm uneasy with this term because so few of them are true believers in free markets, preferring monopolies, cartels, and government contracts. But his point is well taken. The idea that the world must be run by the stock market is as mad as any other fundamentalist delusion, Islamic, Christian, or Marxist. In the case of Easter Island, the statue cult became a self-destructive mania, an ideological pathology. In the United States today, market extremism has bled with evangelical extremism to fight intelligent policy on messianic grounds. Mainstream Christianity is an altruistic faith, yet this offshoot is actively hostile to the public good, a kind of social Darwinism by people who hate Darwin. President Reagan's Secretary of the Interior told Congress not to bother with the environment because, in his words, I don't know how many future generations we can count on until the Lord returns. George W. Bush surrounded himself with similar minds and pulled out of the Kyoto Accord on climate change. Adolf Hitler once gleefully exclaimed, What luck for the rulers that the people do not think! But what can we do, what can we do, when the rulers will not think? Civilizations often fall quite suddenly. 
the house of cards effect, because as they reach full demand on their ecologies, they become highly vulnerable to natural fluctuations. The most immediate danger posed by climate change is weather instability causing a series of crop failures in the world's bread baskets. Droughts, floods, fires, and hurricanes are rising in frequency and severity. The pollution surges caused by these and by wars add to the gyre of destruction. Alfred Crosby sardonically observed, Mother Nature always comes to the rescue of a society stricken with overpopulation, and her ministrations are never gentle. The case for reform that I've tried to make is not based on altruism, nor on saving nature for its own sake. I happen to believe these are moral imperatives, but such arguments cut against the grain of human desire. The most compelling reason for reforming our system is that the system is in no one's interest. It's a suicide machine. All of us have some dinosaur inertia within us, but I honestly don't know what the activist dinosaurs, the hard men and women of big oil and the far right, think they're doing. They have children and grandchildren who will need safe food and clean air and water and who may wish to enjoy healthy oceans and forests. Wealth can buy no refuge from pollution. Pesticides sprayed in China condense in Antarctic glaciers and rocky mountain tarns. And wealth is no shield from chaos, as the surprise on each haughty face that rolled from the guillotine made clear. There's a saying in Argentina that each night God cleans up the mess the Argentines make by day. This seems to be what our leaders are counting on, but it won't work. Things are moving so fast that inaction itself is one of the biggest mistakes. The 10,000-year experiment of the settled life will stand or fall by what we do and don't do now. The reform that's needed is not anti-capitalist, anti-American, or even very deep environmentalist. It is simply the transition from short-term to long-term thinking, from recklessness and excess to moderation and the precautionary principle. The great advantage we have, our best chance for avoiding the fate of past societies, is that we know about those past societies. We can see how and why they went wrong. Homo sapiens has the information to know itself for what it is. A species of Ice Age hunter only half evolved towards intelligence, clever but seldom wise. We are now at the stage when the Easter Islanders could still have halted the senseless cutting and carving, could have gathered the last tree's seeds to plant out of reach of the rats. We have the tools and the means to share resources, clean up pollution, dispense basic health care and birth control, to set economic limits in line with natural ones. If we don't do these things now, while we prosper, we will never be able to do them when times get hard. Our fate will twist out of our hands, and this new century will not grow very old before we enter an age of chaos and collapse that will dwarf all the dark ages in our past. Now is our last chance to get the future right. Thank you very much. Ideas tonight from the Macmillan Theatre at the University of Toronto. You've been listening to The Rebellion of the Tools, the fifth and last of the 2004 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright, and the lecture series is called A Short History of Progress. 
The 2004 Massey Lectures are published as a book by the House of Anansi Press, and Ronald Wright is taking part in an online forum to discuss the lectures at www.anansi.ca. You can purchase the Massey Lectures either as a book or a CD by calling Ideas Transcripts and using your credit card. The number to call is 416-205-7367. Taxes and shipping are included, and the book costs $23.95. The five CDs sell in stores for $49.95, but you can buy it through Ideas Transcripts for the special price of $44.95 which also includes taxes and shipping. Again, the number to call is 416-205-7367. Tonight's lecture was recorded by Tim Lorimer. Our partners in the Massey Lectures are the House of Anansi Press and Massey College in the University of Toronto. The Massey Lectures were produced for ideas by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of ideas is Bernie Lucht, And I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned to CBC Radio 1 for the hourly news, followed by the Arts Tonight and Between the Covers.